right, good morning. Um, we were waiting for the last couple of jurors, but I did want to put something on the record this morning before we get started. I emailed you all uh, yesterday evening about one of the jurors who sent a message to my office after we sent the notification that he had been selected. Um, and I believe it's juror number 36. Yeah, juror number 36. And this was an email that he sent at 6.17 p.m. that says, hi, Twee, that's my judicial assistant. As I stated in today in court, my wife is having serious pregnancy complications and it is going to be incredibly hard for me to pull this off. I'm happy to provide a doctor's note regarding my wife's condition, but I'm currently the sole carer of our two-year-old son. Please let me know my options from here as soon as possible. So that was the initial email that we received that I sent to you. And then later yesterday evening at 724, he sent another email that says, hi Twee, I just made other arrangements for my wife and I'm good to go. So don't even worry about it. Thanks for the quick response. We'll be there 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. And he's here. So my suggestion is that we just sort of leave it alone and not address it at this point. I'm sure he'll let us know if there are any other issues. So is there anything else we need to put on the record or address in regards to that? Yes, Your Honor. We just had a minor scheduling issue um, this morning. We had to move our tra the travel arrangements for the medical examiner is coming from Little Rock, Arkansas, a couple of times this week due to the child being pushed back a couple of days. Um, therefore, we were only able to get her off standby flight this morning. Well, she was bumped this morning at 5 a.m. The new plan is to fly her in and have her here. She can be here by 9, we believe, on Tuesday morning. And she would just be the last witness that we call. So, although I had anticipated that we would put all of our witnesses up today, tomorrow, we are having that, that kind of a snafu. Okay. So she should be here to and be prepared to test on Tuesday. Tuesday morning, yes. Okay. Um, I think her flight is in at eight, so we will be rushing her from the airport to court. Okay. All right. Anything further before we bring the jury out? Not the state, but may I may I set up briefly? Yes, Mr. Queen. Anything further before we bring the jury out? No, no.
sure I have my microphone on. Hope you all had a nice evening. Uh, before we begin with the evidence in the case, I am going to give you some preliminary instructions just to give you an overview of the trial procedure and what you can expect during the course of the trial. Um, this will take me about 10 or 15 minutes to read to you, and then we'll begin with the opening statements from the attorneys. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been sworn in in panel, and you are about to try a criminal case entitled the State of Georgia versus Richard Vincent Merritt. The defendant, Mr. Merritt, has been indicted by the grand jury of DeKalb County in an indictment that I read to you yesterday. To this indictment that I read to you, the defendant has pled not guilty and denies each and every allegation therein. This is what forms the issue that you have been selected, sworn, and impaneled to try. Before we begin the trial, I'm going to give you some preliminary instructions on fundamental principles of criminal law. I will also <coughs> instruct you on the role of the judge, the jury, and the lawyers and give you an overview of the trial procedure. Many of you may have never served on a jury before and it is therefore necessary that these instructions be given so that you have a general understanding of the procedure in a criminal trial, what will be expected of you and how you are to conduct yourself during the trial. The defendant is charged in the indictment with crimes that are violations of certain laws of the state of Georgia. I want to emphasize to you that the indictment, including all of the counts therein, and the plea of not guilty are the legal procedures by which the criminal charges are brought against the defendant. The charges and plea of not guilty are not evidence of guilt and should not be considered by you as evidence or implication of guilt of any crime whatsoever. This defendant is presumed to be innocent until he is proven guilty. The defendant enters upon the trial of the case with a presumption of innocence in his favor and that presumption remains with the defendant until it is overcome by the state with evidence that is sufficient to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the crime or crimes charged. Under our system, it is my duty as the trial judge to determine the law that applies to this case and to instruct you, the jury, on the specific rules of law that you must apply to the facts in arriving at a verdict. I am giving you some of those instructions now and I will give you more detailed instructions after the evidence has been presented and the lawyers have made their closing arguments. During the trial, I may be called upon to rule on motions or objections to evidence. Nothing I say in making these rulings or at any time during the trial is evidence and should not be considered as an indication that I have any leaning in this case whatsoever. My only interest in this case is to see that it is fairly tried according to the laws and constitution of the state of Georgia and the constitution of the United States. As expected, the lawyers serve as advocates for their clients and are duty bound to represent their clients to the best of their ability. The lawyers also serve as officers of this court and as such are bound to follow applicable laws, trial procedure and rules of evidence during the trial. If at any time the lawyers believe that any law, procedure, or rule of evidence is being violated, they may make motions regarding the conduct of the trial or objections to the admission of evidence. In making these motions or objections, the lawyers are see simply seeking to fulfill their duties to their clients and to the court. Sometimes these motions or objections may require the court to consider outside your presence the questions raised and you will be excused to the jury room. We will try to minimize the number and length of these interruptions and ask for your patience in this regard. Ladies and gentlemen, trial procedure in a criminal trial is generally as follows. First, the attorneys for both sides have the opportunity to make what is called a an opening statement. This opening statement is not evidence. Remember that what the lawyers say is not evidence, but is a preview or an outline of what they expect the evidence to be. Following the opening statements, the evidence will be presented. Evidence can be in the form of testimony given by witnesses or physical evidence that will be labeled with exhibit numbers for identification. After the presentation of all of the evidence, the attorneys have the opportunity to make what is called a closing argument or summation. At this time, the attorneys may suggest which laws 
are applicable and how they should be considered in light of the evidence and point out to you certain parts of the evidence that they think are favorable to their position. The goal of a closing argument is to persuade you to decide the case in their favor. Following the closing arguments, I will charge you more specifically on the law that applies to this case. I will then ask you to retire to the jury room to deliberate and reach your verdict. The jury has a very important role. It is your duty to determine the facts of the case and to apply the law to those facts. I will instruct you on the laws that apply to this case, but you must determine the facts from the evidence. Evidence by definition is the means by which any fact and issue is established or disproved. Evidence consists of two things, testimony and exhibits. Testimony is the testimony that you will hear under oath from those who take the witness stand. Exhibits are those documents, photographs, or other physical evidence that are admitted into evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, the object of this trial is to discover the truth. During the trial, the admission of evidence will be governed by certain rules of evidence. Those rules were drafted with one prominent purpose in mind, and that purpose is the discovery of the truth. Consequently, the rules of evidence seek to assure that only the best and highest evidence is admitted for your consideration. During the trial, the attorneys have a right to object to the admission of evidence if they believe its admission would violate a rule of evidence. I will admit or exclude the evidence according to those rules. If I overrule an objection, this means that you are allowed to consider the evidence being offered. On the other hand, if I sustain an objection, this means you may not consider the evidence being offered. You should consider only that testimony and only those exhibits that are admitted, and you should draw no inferences and make no assumptions about the evidence objected to if the objection was sustained. In the event that you hear or see inadmissible evidence before an objection can be made and ruled upon, if the objection is sustained, I will instruct you to disregard it, and you should disregard that evidence entirely in your deliberations and in arriving at your verdict. You, the jury, must determine the credibility and believability of the witnesses. It is for you to determine which witness or witnesses you believe and which witness or witnesses you will not believe if there are some whom you do not believe. In determining the credibility or believability of witnesses, you may consider all of the facts and circumstances of the case, the manner in which the witnesses testify, their intelligence, their interest or lack of interest in the case, their means and opportunity for knowing the facts about which they testify, the nature of the facts about which they testify, the probability or improbability of their testimony, and the occurrences about which they testify. You may also consider their personal credibility insofar as it may appear to you from the trial of the case. As the fact finder, it is your duty to believe the witnesses whom you think are most believable. It is for you alone to determine what testimony you will believe and what testimony you will not believe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important that you pay close attention to the evidence as it is presented during the trial. If at any time you are unable to hear or see any evidence being presented, or if you are suffering from any discomfort that diverts your attention, please feel free to inform me and I will do whatever is necessary to assure that you are able to hear and see the evidence being presented and give it your undivided attention. If you are in need of a recess at any time, please raise your hand and I will recognize you. It is vitally important that you are as comfortable as possible so that you can focus on the evidence being presented. It is important that you view this evidence with an open mind at all times and reach no final conclusions until the trial is over. Do not jump to conclusions before all of the evidence is presented. Also remember that during the course of the trial, it would be improper for you to discuss this case with anyone or to allow anyone to discuss the case with you or in your presence or hearing. This applies even to discussions among yourselves in the jury room or elsewhere before actual deliberations begin. 
I have asked the bailiff to provide you with pencils and notepads for your use during the trial. You may take notes, but you are not required to do so. If you decide to take notes, please remember that note taking should not divert you from paying full attention to the evidence and evaluating witness credibility. Your observations of the witnesses during their testimony can be vital to your determination of the believability of their testimony. The notes that you take are for your use only and are not to be shared with anyone until you begin deliberation with your fellow jurors. Notes are not evidence, only memory aids, and should not take precedence over your recollection. It is the duty of each juror to recall the evidence, and while you may consider another juror's notes to refresh your memory, you should rely on your own recollection of the proceedings. Do not be influenced by the notes of other jurors unless their notes help you in determining your own independent recollection. Notes are not entitled to any greater weight than the recollection or impression of each juror as to what the evidence may have been. After the trial is over, the notes will be collected and destroyed. I instruct you, ladies and gentlemen, that you must decide this case for yourself solely on the testimony you hear from the witness stand and the exhibits admitted into evidence. You may not visit any scenes depicted by the evidence. You may not utilize any books or documents not in evidence during your deliberations. You may not read or listen to any accounts of the trial that might appear in the news media. You may not discuss this case with anyone other than your fellow jurors during your deliberations. That concludes my preliminary instructions and we are now ready for the lawyers to give their opening statements. Before they do that though, I do need to swear you in as our trial jury. So if you all will please stand and raise your right hands. You shall well and truly try the issue formed upon this bill of indictment between the state of Georgia and Richard Vincent Merritt, who is charged with murder, two counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, and possession of a knife during the commission of a felony, and a true verdict give according to the evidence, so help you God. If this is your oath, please state, I will. All right, thank you. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before the state begins with its opening statement, I do want to um, bring something to your attention. Uh, we do have media coverage of the case going on in the courtroom this week and next week. Um, the cameras are not to be uh, pointed at you. They're here to, to capture the proceedings and not you, okay? So I don't want you all to be distracted by that or um, to be concerned about it. Um, so please don't let that distract you from paying full attention to the evidence as it is being presented. And again, as I told you before we got started yesterday, if you are something that you hear or see makes you uncomfortable that you think needs to be brought to my attention, please make sure that you do that um, as quickly as possible. Speak to one of the deputies and they will let me know that we need to address something, okay? So, all right. So we are now ready for the state to begin its opening argument. As I told you before, the state has the burden of proof in a criminal case, so the state has the right to speak to you first. Yes. Shirley 
Merritt were alive today, she would have just celebrated her 50th Mother's Day as the defendant's mother. And during the course of this trial, you are going to learn a lot about Shirley. And I think that the theme that you will see is that she was somebody who was always giving of herself. Um, she could have retired um, years before, but because she loved her job in patient and family services at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, she continued to work there until the day of her death. Um, she was the kind of person that if you were her friend and if it was your birthday, she would have made you one of her famous butt cakes. She loved cooking meals for her family. She loved going to her grandson Jack's games and band concerts. Um, but the person that she probably gave the most to was her youngest son, Richard. Now, the defendant had been an attorney here in the Atlanta area, and it was Shirley who gave him the funds to set up his own practice. On the outside, everything looked fine for the defendant. He was married to his wife, Janine, who was a veterinarian here in town. He had two kids, both of whom were in private school, and he had his own law practice. And he was in court in Cobb County all the time. But it was discovered that he had violated the trust of his mother, of his wife, of his kids, and of many of his clients. Starting sometime in 2014-15, several of his clients started coming out of the woodwork, reporting that he was stealing from them. Cobb County investigated the charges and found that he had, in fact, stolen hundreds of thousands of dollars and defrauded many of his clients, most of whom were elderly. They charged him with a 34 count indictment with several counts of theft by taking, various uh, degrees of forgery and uh, uh, exploitation of elderly victims. Finally, the defendant was arrested by Cobb County and it was his mother, Shirley, put up the money to bail him out of jail. Janine, having learned of this ongoing deception, asked for a divorce, and it was Shirley who opened the door to her home in Stone Mountain for the defendant to have a place to live. Now, as you learned during the course of this trial, Shirley was truly disappointed in her son. Um, she was not pleased with his actions. But still, she was his mother, and she wasn't about to let him sit in jail or live on the street. Finally, on January 18th of 2019, exactly two weeks before the day of the murder, the defendant faced a Superior Court judge in Cobb County and entered a guilty plea to all 34 counts on the Cobb County indictment. The judge sentenced him to 15 years to serve. Um, and for some reason, the judge decided to give him two weeks before he had to turn himself into the jail. He gave him two weeks to get his affairs in order before spending 15 years in the Department of Corrections custody. However, there were some caveats to that. First of all, the defendant had to wear an angle mark so that the court system could keep tabs on his whereabouts to prevent him from running. The defendant continued to live in Shirley's house during this period of time. And I'm gonna tell you, Shirley was an emotional person and she was distraught over the fact that her son had been convicted of these charges and over the fact that her son was gonna go away for some time, but still, she wasn't going to let him live on the streets for these two weeks. Shirley confided in a close family member who's going to testify, he's gonna be the first witness the state calls today, um, 
Um, his name is Mike Jeffcoat. Um, Mike is a cousin of Shirley's husband. And even though Shirley's husband died several years before the murder, um, Shirley remained in close contact with him. They were exactly 10 years apart in age, and they just had a really good relationship. Mike Jeffcoat and his wife, Joan, lived in Birmingham. They still do. And Shirley would call him and text him, and you're going to see some of the distress in the text messages that she sent him during this two-week period. Well, knowing that Shirley was going to likely be too emotional to drive her son to the jail, um, Jeff Coates suggested that he and Joan drive from Birmingham to Stone Mountain the morning of February 1st, which was the turning date, and that Mike would drive the defendant to the Cobb County Jail, which is about 45, to an hour, 45 minutes away to an hour away, um, while Joan remained at home to keep Shirley company. They were even planning on spending the night because they didn't want Shirley to be alone. Um, none of that ever happened. On the morning of February 1st, uh, Mike Jeffco got what he considered to be a very uncharacteristic text message from Shirley. It said, Mike, I wish you wouldn't come. Please come another weekend. Things are bad here. Mike was worried, but he knew that Shirley was somebody who was emotional and he wanted to give Shirley and the defendants their privacy on that day. So he and Joan decided not to drive into Atlanta. Well, that text message was the last Mike Jeffcoat or anyone ever heard from Shirley. The next time Mike saw her was the next morning when he drove into Atlanta, went into her house, and found her dead at the bottom of the basement stairs. The defendant, in the meantime, never turned himself in to the Cobb County Jail at 5 o'clock, by 5 o'clock on February 1st. And by this time, he was gone, in the wind. Not to be found until a nationwide manhunt uncovered him Nashville, Tennessee, eight months later, and we're going to talk about what he did during that period of time during the course of the trial, and I'm going to get back to that in a few minutes. So let's go back to what happened to Shirley. The medical examiner found that she had been stabbed four times in the back, one time in the side. She had been stabbed under the right clavicle in the neck, which severed her jugular and caused her to bleed out. She was stabbed several times in the face and the force was so strong, ladies and gentlemen, that the blade of that nine inch knife lodged into the bones in her skull and her hand broke off. But that wasn't enough because laying next to her, Crime scene investigators found a 35-pound dumbbell with blood and hair on the end. And the medical examiner found that the right side of her head had basically been bludgeoned. It had been bashed in to the point where the basal bones in her skull were shattered. Investigators arrived on the scene, and it was very clear to them that this had not been a case where an intruder came into the house and killed Shirley Merritt. There were no open or broken windows. All the doors were closed. There was no sign of forced entry or any tampering at all. All the furniture was upright. There were valuables that had not been stolen. In fact, Shirley Merritt's purse was still on the scene, and it had blank checks in it. 
What's more, the two weapons that were used weren't something that somebody had brought in. They came from inside the house. The knife with a nine-inch blade was a kitchen knife that came right out of Shirley Merritt's own knife block on her kitchen counter. The, the dumbbell was in storage, waiting in her basement, and you're going to actually see the mark on the carpet where it had been resting prior to the defendant picking it up and killing his mother with it. What's more, you know what Shirley had been doing when she was attacked and killed? She was cooking the defendant his last meal before he had turned himself into the jail that afternoon. Investigators found spaghetti and Shirley's famous bolognese sauce, hot and cooking on the stove, along with a salad that she is about to toss and a loaf of garlic bread that she had just gotten out of the oven. all this time, well, he went into hiding, but he wasn't hiding under a rock. He drove off out that day, um, and he went, we don't know where he went, but we know where he ended up. He went to Nashville, Tennessee, and he started a whole new life. He met people out there. He got a job at a bar. He started online dating and, in fact, met a woman who he started a relationship with. But just like his clients, and just like his wife, and his kids, and his mother, he lied to her as well. Because he lived under an alias the entire time he was out in Tennessee. And you know what? I'm going to tell you now. It's a ridiculous alias. Um, so ridiculous that I'm not even going to tell you what it is. You'll hear it when the witnesses <coughs> testify, and you're going to see the fake driver's license that he made with that name on it. He was arrested ten months. Eight, I'm sorry, eight months later, on September 30th of 2019, by um, Gerard Hunt and his team with the U.S. Marshal's Office after a nationwide man -cut. You know how You know how they found him? He was driving Shirley Merritt's Lexus that he had stolen from her garage after he killed her. A few things I want to go over. First of all, something that's really important in this case is the timeline. And investigators were able to put together a very precise timeline. In fact, we know where the defendant was almost every minute of February 1st of 2019 because we have something that we don't have in a lot of homicide cases. As I told you, when the judge in Cobb County gave the defendant two weeks to turn himself in, he ordered him to wear an ankle monitor. So we're able to put tabs on the defendant's whereabouts almost the entire day until he cut his monitor off. That morning, the defendant woke up at his mother's house on Planters Row. Excuse me. Um, he left the home at 8 a.m. Um, his daughter, who is disabled, had an appointment with a neurologist. And the defendant agreed to go. It was kind of his last goodbye to his daughter, Mia. And he met his then wife, now ex wife, Janine, there. It was a doctor's appointment in Sandy Springs. Um, he returned to the house on Planters Row at 9 38 that morning. Just one minute later, Mike Jeffco got, again, what he considered to be a suspicious uncharacteristic text from Shirley Merritt saying things are real bad here. Don't come. Now, you're going to see the text messages. They are a screenshot. Um, the time on the text message actually says 8.39 a.m., but remember, that was 
so he's going to explain to you that he actually did receive that at 8.39 a.m. Birmingham time, but it was actually 9.39 a.m., what would be considered Atlanta time. The defendant leaves the residence, according to the ankle monitor records, at 2.30 p.m. So we know that sometime between 9.38 and 2.30, Charlie started making lunch. She set the table for two, put the pot of bolognese sauce on the stove, cooked the spaghetti, but that meal was never touched. Because between those times, between 9.38 and 2.30, the defendant was at the house, and sometime during those hours, he killed Shirley Merritt. The defendant leaves the residence at 2.30, and he travels north up to Norcross. He stops at Kroger just for a couple of minutes, probably to gas up on the way. And he arrives at a QT station in Norcross at 2.52 p.m. Detectives pulled the surveillance camera from that QT station, and you're going to have a chance to watch it during the course of that trial. And you know what's really interesting about that is that the defendant isn't in his own car, which had been left at the scene. And you'll see in photographs, he's driving Shirley Merritt's Lexus. It's kind of a dark gray color, kind of crossover SUV. It will be the second vehicle that you see pull into the QT um, entry way. You're going to see the defendant get out of the car. He is wearing a green shirt. It has a design on it that says Ecuador. He walks into the service station. He buys a couple of waters, a candy bar, um, pays cash, and then he leaves. He then travels west on I-285, and he travels north on I-75. At 412, the defendant exits I-75 onto the Cass White Road exit. Um, and at 414, the ankle monitor company gets the alert that he has cut off his ankle monitor. Um, Steve Queen, who worked with CSRP, which is the security company that was monitoring the ankle monitors at that time, um, he received the alert immediately. He happened to be up in the Cartersville area. He lived up there, so he uh, called the police. They rushed to that pilot truck stop where the GPS was pinging, but they were 14 minutes too late. They found the ankle monitor. Um, they did not find Richard Merritt. He had cut the ankle monitor with some kind of knife or instrument and thrown it out in a garbage can under a pizza box at a pilot truck stop. At 5 o'clock, the defendant had been ordered to turn himself into the Cobb County Jail, but he never did. He was long gone by then. Well, by this time, Mike Jeffcoat and some other family members had tried to communicate with Shirley. Um, after five, they got a call from the Cobb County Sheriff's Department learning that the defendant never turned himself in and realizing that they had not heard from Shirley. They got really concerned, so they started calling 911 here in DeKalb County. Um, uh, officers, um, Sergeant John O'Bester and Officer Ashley Nelson from the DeKalb County Police Department, went out to Shirley's house, and you know what they found? They didn't find any signs of forced entry. They found that all of the windows were intact, there had been no signs of tampering, uh, the garage door was closed, and let me tell you, they tried to get into that house. Um, they arrived there at 5.39 p.m. and were there for actually a couple of hours. Um, they looked into the windows, they didn't see any kind of signs of a struggle. But what they did see is Shirley Merritt's purse just sitting there, which they found to be very strange. They also saw the defendant's car. It was a black Honda. It was a car that Shirley had bought for him after she posted bond for him, and it was out in the 
driveway. Well, at this point, um, everyone was concerned and really worried for Shirley. Um, Mike Jeffco made the decision the next morning to wake up early and drive from Birmingham to Georgia. Um, he was able to get a key from the defendant's ex-wife for Shirley's house. He went in and that's when he saw Shirley laying in the basement. He called 911 on February 2nd at 9.28 a.m. and that's when they arrived and started to investigate. A couple of things um, that I do want to go over about this case. First of all, we sent some items to the crime lab. We sent three items to the crime lab. One was a handle that had come off the knife that was used to kill Shirley. One was the dumbbell that had been used to bludgeon her in the head. Um, we sent them off for fingerprints and for DNA testing. Um, the results didn't show that the defendant didn't have his hands on his items. They were just inconclusive, which is kind of what was expected because of the materials that these items were made out of. Um, they weren't like fabric, um, which, would, which would be something that would collect and hold on to DNA cells. So they just weren't able to get enough DNA cells off that dumbbell to sufficiently test. Um, and it wasn't like the knife was made out of glass, which is something that would be able to kind of maintain fingerprints. They, it, they just weren't able to get anything off of them. Again, the lab technicians are going to explain this to you. They're going to say, listen, this isn't, this doesn't mean that the defendant hadn't held these items. Um, you're also going to hear that when Shirley Merritt's autopsy was performed, she had a clump of hair in her right hand. We sent those off to the lab as well. They were both microanalyzed and um, their DNA was compared. Um, all of the hairs that could be compared to Shirley Merritt's known hair were her known hair. Um, and it makes sense because, as you will see, when she was found, she was crumpled up the bottom of the stairs with her hands at her head, having been stabbed in the face. Another thing, you're going to see a lot of exhibits here the testimony of several witnesses. I'm just going to tell you now, the exhibit numbers are not going to be in order, and I am not going to publish every exhibit on this screen. And that is for the privacy and for the sake of Shirley and her family, some of whom are sitting in court today. Um, however, when you go out into deliberations, you will have the chance to Finally, I know you guys, you all are probably sitting here wondering, what is it that I said that made it put me on this jury? And I'm going to tell you right now, it, it's not, it's not a secret. It's not some you know, one thing that you said. You all are here because we questioned you yesterday. You seem like the kind of folks who think using common sense, and that is your greatest. As you listen to the, the, the testimony, as you view the exhibit, I am going to ask them that you view them through the lens of common sense, which is what the law is going to ask you to do. And when you do, it's going to be very clear to you that the defendant is guilty of all these crimes. Because the facts of this case are very straightforward. I'm not saying that this is going to be an easy trial. We're going to throw a lot of testimony and a lot of exhibits at you. Um, and you're going to be here listening to several witnesses during the course of the next few days. You're going to hear some hard, heartbreaking things. And you're going to see some ugly photographs. 
but it all boils down to common sense. So please keep that in mind as you listen to these witnesses and read the evidence. Because if you do, I am confident that after reviewing all of the evidence in this case, you will come back with a verdict of guilty to malice murder, a verdict of guilty to both counts of felony murder, a verdict of guilty to both counts of aggravated assault, and finally, a verdict of guilty to possession of a knife during the commission. to be presented with evidence and witnesses in this case. You will listen, you will learn, and you will scrutinize all of those things. And I ask that you do so. And I ask that when Mr. Queen gets up here in a few days, stands before you, and ask that you find Mr. Merritt not guilty, that you do so. Because that is what the evidence will show you. And that is what the truth demands. Now I expect over the next few days that the state will come before you just as it has today and focus your attention on the things that they want you to see. They will funnel you to the facts that they want to present. They will focus your attention on the narrow time frame at the end of January 2019 and the beginning early days of February 2019. They will do so to try to deflect from the weeks and months before that. They will narrow your attention to the mistakes that Mr. Merrow made, but not the bigger picture surrounding them. And they will present you, as they did today, with numbers. They will narrow you into the numbers to try to deflect from the science and the facts that they do not have. They will focus you on those few days at the end of January and the beginning of February 2019. Those days in which Mr. Merritt was to turn himself in on a sentence on February 1st. The days of January 30th and January 31st when Mr. Jeffcoat, Ms. Shirley Merritt's husband's cousin, was making communications with Mr. Merritt and Mrs. Merritt about the accommodations for them. They will focus you in on those days and not the bigger picture and days leading up to that. They will focus you in on those days and the mistakes of Mr. Merritt, but not what's surrounding it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the case and the sentence of February 2nd. You will hear that Mr. Merritt was an attorney. And during his time as an attorney, he made mistakes. mistakes he is not avoiding mistakes that he admitted to. During his time, he took money from the clients. Now what the state will try to distract you from is those individuals are part of that case. That case involved a number of, of families and people who had money taken from them. It involved individuals who were upset, understandably. They were angry. They had their, their lives altered, their dreams taken from them, and they were angry. 
You will hear evidence that they were vocal about it. You will hear evidence, I expect, that it went beyond words, that it went into actions, that it went into fear-inducing and stalking behavior. That is the evidence the state will try to distract you from, but I urge you to look at. They will try to do so by again redirecting your attention to Mr. Merritt's mistakes. Mistakes that Mr. Merritt admitted to. Mr. Merritt came before a court and voluntarily pled guilty. He admitted his wrongs, all of them. And he lost his bar license, and he signed up for a lengthy prison sentence. We are not trying to deflect from that. He admitted to that. But the state will try to draw your attention to that and not the individuals and the circumstances and the atmosphere that Mr. Merritt and his family were going through from that case. They will then try to narrow your attention on the numbers as they have today. They will present you with times, times of text messages, times of leaving the house or going to appointments. They will present you with coordinates, location coordinates for where people were or addresses, addresses of Mrs. Merritt, addresses of uh, Janine Minicozzi, his ex-wife and their family, addresses where Mr. Merritt was residing when he was trying to survive and when he was trying to stay under the radar. They will present you with these numbers and narrow you in on these numbers because they are trying to distract from the science and the facts that they do not have. Some of you may be familiar with fairy tale. The Emperor's New Clothes. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that this case is similar to that fairy tale, and it is not far from it. In that fairy tale, there are weavers who are going to make clothes for an emperor. And if you know this fairy tale well, you will know they do not make clothes. They are attempting to weave <coughs> clothes out of nothing. I submit to you that what you will see in this case is that the state is trying to weave a story to you out of nothing. What is this nothing? What will you not have that you need to see? You will have no forensic evidence in this case. There will be no fingerprints on the knife handle that the state presents to you that match Mr. Merritt. There will be no fingerprints of Mr. Merritt on the dumbbell you are presenting from. There will be no DNA evidence of Mr. Merritt on either of those items. There will be no DNA evidence of Mr. Merritt on Ms. Shirley Merritt. There will be no blood of Mr. Merritt on those items. There will be no blood of Mr. Merritt on his mother. There will be no blood of Mr. Merritt around this scene. You will also hear that Mr. Merritt voluntarily gave his DNA to be considered in this case. But that will not be found. You will have no forensic evidence implicating Mr. Merritt in this murder. You will be presented with no electronic evidence in this case. I expect that you will hear testimony that number, a number of electronics were collected. Desktops, laptops, cell phones, iPads. There will be no information on any of those Tied back to Mr. Merritt in this case. There will be no incriminating search history, no searches to try to destroy evidence. None of that will be presented to you because it's not there. You will not be presented with any information that Mr. Merritt and his mother had disagreements, fights, arguments, or any kind of ill will. You will hear from a number of family members, but you will not hear that there was an argument between them in the days coming up or the times that they were living together for months. Most importantly, you will not hear any testimony that Mr. Merritt was violent. I anticipate that you're going to hear from his ex-wife. You will not hear that he was violent towards her. You will not hear that he was ever violent towards his children. The state has told you that you will hear from a girlfriend of Mr. Merritt. You will not hear any testimony from her that he was violent. 
And most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, you will not hear any testimony that he was ever violent with his mother. You will hear none of this in this case. Because it doesn't exist. Over the next several days, I ask and urge you to not only look at what is there, but what is not there what is not presented to you. Consider that Mr. Merritt is not guilty. Thank you. Are there any witnesses present in the courtroom? No, Your Honor. I do. My name is Mike Jeffcoat, J E F C O A T. Good morning, Mr. Jeffcoat. Good morning. Um, where did you start? Where do you live? I live in Gardendale, Alabama. I'm 71, I am retired, and have lived in Alabama every year except one since 1973. Okay, and um, you said, is that Birmingham, Alabama? Gardendale is a northern suburb of Birmingham. Right, and do you live with anyone else in your home? Uh, my wife lives with me. What is her first name? Her name is Joan. Is her last name also Jeff Coates? No, it's Beck, B-E-C-K. Shirley was married to my first cousin, Ken. Uh, my uh, mother and his father were brother and sister. Ken passed away in 2000, I believe. Do you know how long he and Shirley were married? I don't. Uh, I've, I don't remember when they weren't married. And like I said, I'm 71. And what was the age difference between you and Shirley? 10 years, almost exactly. She had two sons, Richard and Robert. All right, and are either of them here in the courtroom today? I see Richard at the defense table. And what and, is he wearing? Can you just kind of describe? Uh, he's wearing a suit and tie and uh, the black rim glasses right there. Okay, that doesn't help much. <laughs> is um, he sitting in the middle of the table? He is. All right, I'd ask that the record reflects that Mr. Jeff Coat has identified the defendant's record shall so reflect. Um, and is uh, the defendant, Richard, is he the younger or the older of he, the two children? He's the younger. Is the older child in court as well? He is. I see Rob in the back. Okay. And what is, uh, what is the age difference? Do you know? I don't. I just know that Rob is a few years older. Right. Um, and did you have a good relationship with Shirley? I did. Okay. Can you just give a little description of what that relationship was like? Well, um, she was married, like I said, to my first cousin, and I have known Shirley for as long as I can remember, and I just always thought she was a very genuinely nice person. Did she work? She worked in different capacities as her husband was transferred around the country uh, when, she, when they lived in D.C. She was a realtor in the D.C. area, in Northern Virginia, 
and also worked at uh, here most recently before her death at Children's Hospital. All right. And do you know what she did with Children's Hospital? I, I really don't know. Um, and did she have any grandchildren? There were several grandchildren. I think Rob has three or four, and Richard had two. Do you know um, about how old Shirley was at the time of her death? She was 77. And do you know about where she was living? She was living on, uh, I think it was Planters Row in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Do you happen to know what county that is located in? It's in DeKalb County. Right. Do you um, did you uh, maintain contact with Shirley? Yes. And how so? Would you guys talk on the phone, visit? What what was that relationship like? We would talk on the phone. We would text. There were two or three times when I was in Atlanta for extended periods, and I would stay with Shirley for a, a period of time. Just we were friends. All right. Do you recall her phone number? I've got it in my phone. Your Honor, I would ask if Mr. Jeffco could look at his phone um, so that he can remember Mrs. Merritt's phone phone number. Any objection? Oh, okay. right, go ahead, sir. Would you do that, please? Sure. <clears throat> Her cell phone number was 770-378-2989. Your Honor, at this time I move to admit states is at 71 um, via the business record exception to the hearsay rule. This is Ms. Merritt's cell phone records um, from AT&T. Any objection? <coughs> Admitted. Were you also in touch with the defendant Richard Merritt? I was. And um, how often were you in communication with him? Periodically over the years. All right. Um, and what was that relationship like? We were cousins. Do you know what his phone number was? Back his, in 2019? Fo his phone number was area code 404-358-8254. Um, Your Honor, at this time I'd move to admit to 70, which is the defendant's cell phone records. Any objection? No objection. Admitted. And did Richard work? Uh, Richard was an attorney. All right. And do you know anything about his law practice? I don't. All I know is that every time we would see him, he'd talk about how well things were going. Do you know what kind of law he practiced? Uh, I think he uh, practiced personal injury law, and I think he told me he did some criminal defense. Do you know whether he worked for a firm? Uh, the, I think his last uh, affiliation was he was in a firm by himself or with a partner. All right. And um, Mr. Jackson, do you know whether the defendant was married? He was. And what was the name of his wife? His wife's name was Janine. All right. And do you know her last name? Menacozzi is her name now, her maiden name. And um, I want to kind of focus in on what happened in the years prior to um, prior to 2019. Are you aware of the Cobb County charges against the defendant? I am. Okay, how are you familiar with those? His mother ended up telling me about... The, we're not going to go into what she said, but were, were you familiar with them at, at the time of her death? I was. Okay. Um, and did you know what those charges were? Yes. Okay. Um, and what were they? He was uh, accused of fraud and elder abuse had several counts of each. Okay. Before I go any further, there is one thing I forgot to do. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 1. Can you describe what that is? 
This is a picture of Shirley Merritt. She was an excellent cook. She was a great baker. She could make a coconut cake that would bring tears to your eyes. And she was just a genuinely sweet person. Okay. Um, and does that fairly accurately represent what Shirley looked like in life? Yes, it does. I do to admit season one. Any objection? No objection. Admit it. All right, we were talking about the Cobb County charges, is that correct? Yes. Sir, this time I'd also move to admit State Exhibit 2, which is a certified copy of the Cobb County indictment um, and sentence. Um, it's case number 180991 from Cobb County Superior Court. Any objection? No objection. Admitted. Yes. Were you aware that the defendant entered a plea to these charges on uh, January 18th of 2019? Yes. Were you present during the plea? No. What, when, when her son was charged with this list of charges, um, how did Shirley react? It, Just it, it, it broke her heart. She loved both of her sons, and to see Richard throw away his whole life by stealing from clients just broke her heart, knowing that he was going to prison. Was Shirley an emotional person? I'm sorry? Was Shirley emotional? No. Okay. No, Shirley, Shirley was a very level person. Yes. Okay. Um, were you, are you familiar with what the sentence was? Yes. Okay. And are you aware that there was a turn-in date of February 1st, 2019? Yes. Um, did you communicate with either the defendant or Shirley in the days leading up to that? Yes. How did you communicate with them? Both with phone calls and with texts. I did. Are you aware of where the defendant was living between those dates? He was living with his mother. In that stone mountain home? Correct. are the copies of the screenshots of the text between Richard and I. And are those actual recordings of the text messages, in fact, that they were screenshot from your phone? Yes, in fact, I've still got the original text on my phone. And have, they been, um, have there been any material alterations or deletions? No. Right. And what about students that These are texts between Shirley and I. And are those from the same time period between the defendant's plea and his funding date? Yes. All right. And have there been any material alterations or deletions in those? No. All right. Move to admit three and four. Any objection? No objection. Admitted. to um, start by showing the jury states 
exhibit three, which um, <laughs> I described are text messages between you and the defendant. Um, did you and the defendant and Shirley, like, what, what, was, what was the plan for February 1st of 2019? I was aware that he had to turn himself in on February the 1st by 5 o'clock. And I knew that would be very, very difficult on his mother. So Shirley and I and, and Richard had been texting and talking back and forth that week. And my wife and I decided that we would go over there on February the 1st and she would stay at home with Shirley and I would take Richard to report to prison. Friday. Um, and uh, you said that it would be hard on Shirley. Why did you believe it would be hard on Shirley to take her son to the jail? This whole thing had broken her heart and just having to take him down to report uh, to be sentenced or to start his sentence in prison, I thought would be too much for her. And that's the reason we decided to go over there and help. And do you know the approximate distance or rather the time it would take to get from Shirley's house on Flinders Road to the Cobb County Jail? Uh, given Atlanta traffic, I would guess probably an hour around five o'clock. Okay. And would you be coming from Birmingham that morning? Yes. What time were you supposed to arrive at uh, Shirley's house? Probably around two, I think, is what the text messages say. They, uh, they had things they wanted to do prior to that. She um, she wanted to take Richard, but she also was relieved that I was coming over to take him to report to prison. Okay, well, just in general, Shirley's messages, how, how did she text? She, Shirley uh, did not use teenager abbreviations. She texted in full sentences and paragraphs. And she was trying to explain what was going on. Richard's two children. It depended on what Shirley wanted. This We knew this was going to be terribly difficult for her. We told her if she wanted us to stay at her home that night, we would. If not, then we would just turn around after I dropped Richard at the Cobb uh, County Courthouse and go back to Birmingham. I did not. I received text messages from Richard and from Shirley asking me not to come over on Friday morning. I am going to point your attention to State's Exhibit 4, um, the last page of that. You see that on the screen there? 
Yes. Um, tell me about this text message that we were looking at from Shirley. Can you read it to the jury, please? This is where she contacted me, and it says, I mean, everybody can read it. It just says, things are not good here. I can drive into the jail and get myself home without any problem. Richard has some things he has to take care of this morning, so we don't need to leave here before 2 o'clock. That's why he originally said for you to not get here before 1.30. He has a lot of things to we need to talk about. What time did you receive that uh, text message from Shirley? Uh, at 8.39 a.m. Was that Eastern Standard time, DeKalb County time, or was that Birmingham time? That was Central time, Birmingham. Uh, so what time would that have been in DeKalb County? That would have been uh, 9.39 in DeKalb County. And what was your reaction when you received this text message from Shirley? I was a little disturbed. Um, I didn't know what her state of mind was. I knew this was going to upset her. But I also knew that Shirley was a strong woman and could make up her own mind. And if she was requesting that I not come over, I was going to honor that. So uh, did you make the decision not to go in that day? I did. I made the decision. to. I was actually already on the road when I got this, and I turned around and, and went back home. I did. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 3, the last page of that. Uh, what time did you hear from the defendant that morning? That was at 925 Central Time. Okay, and again, what time would that be in, 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 in Cab County time? 1025. He said, thanks again, but as we both told you, she's okay. We need the privacy to talk through some matters. Please call her this weekend to check in. I cannot express how much your help has meant during this nightmare. I'll call you in a few weeks from inside. Love, Rich. And what were you, was your reaction when you received this text message? Uh, at, at this point, this was just more confirmation that I was not wanted at Shirley's house and confirm my decision not to go. Did you ever try to call either the defendant or Shirley Merritt after receiving either of these text messages? I tried to call both. Okay. Why? Um, no, I'm sorry. After receiving these text messages? Yes. No, I did not. No. Um, did you ever hear from Shirley after this? No. Okay. Um, and did that raise any concerns for you? No. She had a whole lot on her plate that day, and I, he, he, I just assumed that she was snowed under, and any communications with me weren't necessary at that point. Yes, it was. And uh, what time would that be in Eastern uh, Standard Time? Five seventeen. Okay. Um, it looks like you tried to reach out to Shirley. It, it's hard to see what is on that text message. Are you able to tell the jury what what you wrote there? Yeah. Hold on. Let me pull it up. I can tell you what it says without looking at it, but, but basically it says, call me please, because I had already received the, the call that he had cut his bracelet and was running. Um, who did you learn that from? I received a call a couple of minutes before that from Janine that she had gotten a call Do you know about what time you received that call from Janine? 
it was, I would say, 10 to 15 minutes after 5 o'clock Eastern time, so 4.15 my time. Uh, pretty much shock that he would do that. Okay. And uh, do you know about how many times you reached out to Shirley after that? I tried to call her phone several times, and I uh, sent her that text asking her to call me. And did you ever hear from her? No. And did, did you reach out to the defendant as well after that? I tried to reach him as well and got no answer. It was very confusing. I didn't know what was going on. My main concern at that point was where was Shirley? Um, and so what did you do? I had several more phone calls with Janine uh, and uh, a couple of other family members. And uh, I was aware that they were trying to locate Shirley too and Richard. I did not. All right. Um, were you aware of whether anyone else did? Yes, I was informed that someone had called the De DeKalb police uh, to come out and try to, to enter the home and see if Shirley was in there. Okay. Did you decide to go to the home that night? I did not that night. It was about, I want to say, 9, 10 o'clock, something like that, my time when I got word that the DeKalb police had gone there and uh, did not have probable cause to make entry. Okay. We're not going to what, what was said, um, but uh, you got word that DeKalb County police had been there and what, what did you do after that? After that, I talked to Janine. I said, I need to get into that house. It's late now. Did so, you have a key to the house? No, but Janine did. I was going to meet Janine and her dad the next morning at about 9 o'clock Eastern time at the entrance to that subdivision to get the key from her to go into the house. Um, and did you, in fact, drive into DeKalb County on February 2nd? I did. About what time did you leave Birmingham? It was uh, probably 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning my time. It was a few minutes before nine. And um, I'm going to show you state's exhibits five and six. I did, at the entrance to the subdivision. Did you get the key? I did. Okay. And um, did you, was anybody with you? That no. Morning? No. Okay. The, they wanted to enter the house with me, and I told them no, because uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to find. Okay. And so I took the key and went to the house. Did you bring anything with you? I was in my truck, and I also had a weapon. Why did you bring a weapon? because I didn't know what I was going to find inside that house. We knew that Richard was in the wind, but we didn't know where he was. Uh, Shirley's car was missing, but he could have gotten back into the house. And were you familiar with Shirley's house? Yes. Looking at exhibits five and six, what are those photographs of? The Exhibit 5 is a picture of the front of the house. Exhibit 6 is a picture of the back door where I made entrance. Do those photographs depict what that house looked like at the time that you arrived on February 2nd? Yes. All right. This time I move to admit stations. It's 5 and 6. Any objection? Okay. Admit it. Thank you. 
Mary Seeds Exhibit 5. Is this a picture of Shirley's house? Yes, it is. Did you go through the front door? No. And did you try to go through the front door? I did. I checked all the doors. They were, all the doors were locked and secured with deadbolts. And so I went around to the back door and made entrance on the next picture through that door. Okay. Um, before we get there, um, how many entrances were there to the house? Do you recall? There were several because they had several glass doors or French doors on the back and they each had doorknobs. And I believe there was also another entrance downstairs in the basement through there. Did you check all of those? I did. I'm sorry? I did. And what did you find? All the doors were locked and secured. Did you see any broken windows? No. Um, did you see any anything that you would consider to be evidence of somebody having broken into that house? No. Tell me about the garage. Where was the garage located? The, if you look at this picture, the garage is over on the left-hand side. The picture that you're, uh, the window at the top is over the garage, and then there is a another window into the garage on the far left, and behind the mailbox post is another window. And was the garage door closed? Yes, the garage door was down and, and closed. Do you know whether Shirley parked her car inside that garage? Normally she did, yes. And what kind of car did she drive? Um, honestly, I don't remember. Um, and were there any vehicles in the driveway? No, mine was the only vehicle. Okay. And, um, I'm going to show you the state exhibit six. What is this a photograph of? That is a picture of the door that I entered on the back of the house in the backyard. It enters into a little hallway. There is a laundry room and a bathroom off to the right as you go in there. Why did you decide to go through that door? I just thought it would be the most convenient to go through. Why is that? Just seemed like it, because the first thing I wanted to do was try to locate her, and that gave me an end point on the house to start going through. I did not. Um, and were you able to get into that door using the key? Yes. What did you see when you went inside the house? I walked in and was checking the rooms as I went through there and did not see anything. And then I moved on into the kitchen and the den. And there's also a bedroom. Uh, on the first floor, didn't see anything there. Uh, went around to the living room, and there wasn't any in the dining room, and there wasn't anything there either. And did you try the door to the garage? Did you go to the garage? I, I exited through the garage. Do you recall if the door that goes into the garage was locked? Yes. It was locked? Yes. No, the only thing that I saw was in the bedroom on the first floor, there were uh, bed linens on the floor. Okay. Um, and did you find Shirley? Uh, not at that point, I didn't. From there, I proceeded to go upstairs and search the upstairs, did not locate her there. And then I came back downstairs and was going into the, the downstairs area, the basement area. I opened the door to the basement area. Uh, the door was not locked, but it was shut and the light was off. I went down the steps and you had to go down and, and make a turn to the right. And when I made the turn to the right, after I'd flipped the light on, Shirley's body was laying at the bottom. I'm gonna show you Stacey's at seven. What is that? 
That is the bottom of the stairs where Shirley was. And is that how you found Shirley on February 2nd, 2019? Yes. Your Honor, this time I'd move to admit students at 7. Any objection? No objection. Admit it. Mr. Jeffcoat, did you go any closer than this to Shirley's body? I did. I called her name. She didn't respond. I went down, checked for a pulse. There was none. And at that point, I knew it was a crime scene, and I backed out. Um, did you notice anything around her body? Honestly, no. I wasn't paying any attention to anything else. No. Um, and what did you do at that point? I, I backed out of there and I called 911. Did police arrive? Yes. I went out, um, back out through the garage. I raised the garage door and walked out on the driveway, called 911, told them what I'd found, what the circumstances were and waited on them to come. How long did it take them to come? Five minutes, something like that. And did, were you there um, when you got there? Yes. And did you speak to officers? I did. Um, did you ever hear from the defendant after this? No. Did you ever reach out to try to, to get in touch with him? No. Have you seen him until today, between that and today? No. Good morning. Okay. The dark blue is me. The light blue is Richard. Correct. So this is you saying, thank you so much. That's a relief for me. was worried about her. He says, I was too. This makes us all feel better. No. So I have the opposite. You have the opposite. That's correct. So Richard is actually starting, starting of these two bubbles of conversation, expressing his worry. This is what's worried about her. 
Well, I said, happy to help make it easier on your mom. I'll be there by one. He replied, thank you so much. That's a relief for me. He was worried about her. Right. So that's Richard responding. I was worried about her. Right. Which I think he texted something about stopping to get a cup of coffee on the way, but that's a, the extent of it. So you didn't text about timing? Well, I, I had already been told not to be there until about 2 o'clock, so I had planned to be there about one thirty or so. Okay. So your testimony is that you didn't text with Mr. Merritt about timing? I don't recall the texture right there in front of me. Yes. He had concerns about traffic. Right. Many of us do. And he wanted to make sure that he was there on time. Right. Now, you testify about the text that you received, um, starting with this merit uh, at 8.39 a.m. on your phone. Right. Yes. And this 839 text, you can just testify about the manner in which Shirley had texted. I believe you texted that she didn't use abbreviations. Right. Right? And this text, 839, it does not use abbreviations, right? Right. We have full words. We have punctuation, right? Right. Right. And that text from Richard was at 925. And again, we have a, a partially cut off text that goes into the full text here. And again, the screenshot that's given to police is taken when you're at the home of the parents, correct? Right, I was sitting in front of it. Yes. In fact, he's saying, please call her this weekend to check in, right? Said he'd call me. Right here, it says, please call her this weekend. Oh, yes. Right. Okay. So she was already anxious. Of course.
Yes. 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 So back on January 18th, he was concerned about her health. Right. Were you aware of hospitalization right before this? Yes. Okay. Um, that was just days before January 18th. Yes. And you know that January 18th was the day that Richard was to be entering his plea in a cop right? Right. So just days before entering that plea, surely had been impossible. Right. Right. And when you left, you had not heard from Shirley. No. And you had not heard from Rich. No. At that time, you didn't know about the car and whether it was there or not. I believe that I was told the night before that Shirley's car was gone, but Rich's car was there, but I, uh, I'm not real clear on that. Right. And you went and you checked the doors. Well, I should start back up a little bit. You met with um, Janine Minicozzi, who is Richard's ex wife, is that right? Yes. And her father. Yes. And his name is Michael Salvatore. Salvatore, is that right? Correct. You met them um, at the gate the, of the subdivision? It wasn't a gate, it was just an entrance to the subdivision. The, the, uh, and that's where I told him to meet me. Yes. Okay. And when you get to the home, I think Ms. Pot asked you, um, you started to go to the doors. Yes. You don't know how many doors are on that home? Uh, I walked all the way around it and rattled every door, and they were all secure. Okay, but you don't know how many doors there are? Not right offhand, no. Now you go inside the home, and you're the first person to find Miss um, Merritt. Yes. Right. And then you called law enforcement. Right. And, uh, you waited for them to come. Yes. Right? And you did not try to ascertain who had been at that scene before you. No. You didn't try to investigate yourself. No. No. You did not witness that. I did not. I have no additional questions, Jane. Any redirect? No, no. Any the witness be excused? Yes. Ms. Wolf Grover? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Party next witness. And your Mr. Judge wishes may he come back into the courtroom. Yes, yes. Okay. You're
will be in recess for 10 minutes and we'll break for lunch at 12.
May you see it. in
You all may be seated. Janine, Janine Caruso Minicosi. You want me to spell my whole name? Caruso, C A R U S O. Good morning, Ms. Minicosi. What is your relationship to the defendant, Richard Merritt? I am his ex wife. And how long were you married? 19 years. Um, I want to talk about you for a little bit. Um, where do you live? Just kind of around what area of town? I live in Marietta. I live and in East Cobb. Are you from this area originally? I grew up in Metro Atlanta, yes. And what kind of work do you do? Um, I'm a small animal veterinarian. And do you have a practice? Um, I work at a practice in Vinings. Right. Yeah. And when did you and the defendant get married? Um, May of 1999. How did you all meet? We met um, at the University of Georgia when I was a freshman and he was a sophomore. Did you both graduate from the University of Georgia? We did. And where did the defendant go to law school? He went to law school at Mississippi College in Jackson. Okay. Um, are you all Georgia fans? Yes. Okay. Um, and do you have children together? We do. We have two children. What are their names and ages? We have an 18-year-old son named Jackson, and I have a 16-year-old daughter named Mia. Um, can you just briefly um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about your kids? Um, is, is Jack in high school? Um, Jack is graduating high school on Monday. And my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter, will be starting high school in the fall. Um, she's about to be 17. She um, is disabled. Um, she has cerebral palsy. Um, she's um, a delightful child. Yeah. <clears throat> and when you were married to the defendant, what kind of work did he do? Um, he was an attorney, but not when we first got married. When did he become an attorney? Um, he became an attorney quite some time after he graduated. Um, it took him three times to pass the bar. Okay. And um, did he work for a firm? He worked for many firms. All right. Did he, uh, what kind of law did he practice? He practiced many different kinds of law. Okay. Over the years, he had a lot of different jobs at a lot of different firms doing different things. Prior to losing his license, what was he doing? He had his own private practice prior, prior to losing his license. Okay. And how was that funded? <clears throat> when he started his practice, yes. how was it funded? Um, his mother gave him all of the money that he needed to start his law practice. All right. <clears throat> and how long were you all married? 19 years. When you and the defendant were married, what kind of lifestyle did you live? Um, we lived, I guess, what you could call like a fun, jet-setting lifestyle. We had really good child care, so we were able to travel a lot. Um, we went a lot of places. We had a lot of fun. Um, we had a lot of friends. We were very social. We had parties often. Were your kids in private school? Um, my son was in private school up through eighth grade, and Mia was always in public school because she needed special education because of her disability. All right. And what were the reasons that you divorced the defendant? I divorced the offense. I divorced my ex-husband when I found out about his double life and his crimes and what he had done to all those people and what he had done to us. And specifically, what was that? What did he do to us? Yes. Let's see. He didn't pay our mortgage for six months, so we lost our home. 
at the time of his arrest, January of 2018, we lost our electricity because he hadn't paid the bill. I had a van that I used to transport my daughter and, my, and her wheelchair, and he pawned the van, so I lost my car. Is there any um, Your Honor, I, I didn't expect the question to go that quite that deeply, so we'll move on. Judge Moon's right. Strike what? Strike what? Well, I, I think the testimony that was provided was responsive to the question, but I will sustain the objection. All right. When did you ask the defendant for a divorce? I served him divorce papers five days after he was arrested. And when was that? January. He was arrested January 31st of 2018. So five days later, I asked for divorce. All right. And when was the arrest? Or when was, I'm sorry, the divorce final? Um, it was about June 20th <coughs> of me. that year. So it was four, four months later. Okay. Um, and you said that the defendant had been arrested on, in what jurisdiction was he arrested? Um, he, Cobb County. Um, uh, did you, <coughs> did you post his bond? No. I never, no. Okay. Who posted his bond? His mother. Um, Your Honor, this time I move to admit Stu's Exhibit 83, which is a certified copy of the defendant's um, bond paperwork from March of 2018. Any objection? Objection. No <coughs> um, Your Honor, may the jury see the, well, I think I can have I don't remember. I know it was a lot, and I know she put up her house. I'm going to zoom in. All right, Ms. Minicosi, what was your relationship with Shirley Merritt like? Well, she was my mother-in-law. And we included her, I included her as part of our immediate family because she was so close to my children. Her grandchildren were her entire world. Um, she was at birthdays and baseball games and band concerts and we talked to her a lot. We were together for holidays and birthdays, etc. Okay. And did you maintain a relationship with Shirley after you divorced the defendant? I stayed in a contact with her, yes. And why um, did you did you communicate with her as often? No. Okay. Did you visit her at her home in the Smoke Rise area? Um, yes, I did. I would bring the kids over there to see her, um, and I, I did go over there and see her. Did you maintain uh, what you would consider to be a good relationship with Shirley? Um, I was polite to her, but our relationship became strained during that time because she did not want me to divorce Richard and was very adamant about it, and we used to argue about it. So. Okay. Um, and, I mean, was that, were these big arguments, or, I mean, how did, how did that play out? I didn't have big arguments with her. We had a lot of terse conversations that were contentious. I never fought with her. I always treated her with love because I did love her. Okay. And um, after the divorce, did you maintain any kind of relationship or contact with the defendant? I did have contact with him because I was letting him see my daughter almost every Sunday. Um, would you consider Shirley to be a good grandmother? <laughs> Yes, she was the best grandmother. She was the best grandmother. And did she cook? Yes. 
any specialties. Um, she was a very good cook. I think I would say her specialty would be southern soul food, <laughs> which everybody really loved. Um, her desserts were really good. Well, let me, let me back up to this. Um, were there any special meals that she would cook for the defendant? Yes. Um, one of the favorite things that she made was her spaghetti and the, the sauce recipe, and I actually use that recipe myself to this day. <clears throat> what was the relationship between the defendant and his mother like? Contentious. They argued a lot. Um, she did a lot to help us, yet he wasn't always nice to her. He would get frustrated with her because he thought she was too involved in our lives a lot of the time. What do you mean she would do a lot to help you? She did so much to help us. Um, she helped us buy a house when we were young. Um, when we were first married, <clears throat> before Richard was an attorney, she helped us out financially because I was a student and we needed help paying our bills. Um, and of course, like I said, she gave him the money he needed to start his firm. Um, and when the defendant was arrested, did he hire a defense attorney? He did. Okay. Uh, do you know who paid for that? Shirley paid for it. Okay. Did you or the defendant owe Shirley any money at the time of her death? Um, I'm, I know he had borrowed money from her that he intended to pay back, but the understanding was he was never going to pay her back. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you ever hear, you said that there were, there were, there was some contentiousness between the two of them. What in general were there arguments about? Everything. Okay. Everything. All right. Um, and what was Shirley's reaction after learning that the defendant had committed these crimes against his clients? Oh, gosh. Without going into anything that she would have said. Right, right. She was <laughs> devastated. Okay. She was devastated that her son had been capable of hurting all those people. It, it ruined her life. So the de defendant was, well, where was the defendant living at that point? After he was bonded out? Yes. Uh, with her. She took him in. All right. Um, and was he living with her up until the day of her death? Yes. The defendant was sentenced in Cobb County on January 18th of 2019. Um, what was your relationship with him at that point? Um, I was still talking to him, he was still seeing the children, and we had made arrangements for him to say goodbye to the children before he was supposed to report, so we were still in contact with each other. Did he ever discuss the charges with you? Yes. Okay. And what was his attitude toward them? Jack Rollins. Your Honor, I think it, it goes to the motive in this case. Um, I, I think it goes to kind of his frame of mind during this entire time period and during the time that we are alleging that he, he killed Shirley. I can't see where this witness can talk about his frame of mind. I think she can talk about what she vis visually observed um, and what he told her um, during this time period.
What are you trying to elicit, Ms. Pot? Your Honor, according to Janine, the defendant was, uh, he never showed any kind of remorse. He's a bit flippant about the charges. Um, I think this goes to the day of the crime. Our theory of the case is that he made the decision not to turn himself in. What we believe happened is that that's what the argument between he and his mother was about that day. Um, we think that she was cooking him dinner. She was you know, insistent that he do his time and do the right thing, but he, he didn't feel that that was something that was necessary. But this witness wasn't present for any of that alleged discussion that took place that morning, so what personal knowledge would she have of what his state of mind was that day. Well, we believe it was it was ongoing. That during, you know, he never, he, he just that he that there was kind of the underlying question of whether he was going to turn himself in during this entire two week period. And this witness has personal knowledge of that because why? Well, she would just say that he didn't show any remorse um, he, to her. What was that? To her? Correct. Correct. I've uh, never showed any remorse that she saw. Um, she was kind of in the back when he entered his plea that day on January 18th. But in this case, he's not charged with absconding from entering into prison that day. He's charged with a homicide. And I don't see how that's relevant to whether or not he committed this offense. Okay. Well, we do believe that that was part of his motive um, in killing his mother. And the absconding was, you know, he, he took her phone and her car um, and was trying to get out. <coughs> okay. I, I don't think this witness okay. is competent to testify okay. to that. Okay. All right. If you bring your witness back in. Did you want to say anything else? No, 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 you can run ahead. All right. <clears throat> and uh, keep an eye on the time because we're going to stop right at 12.
You may be seated. Go ahead, Ms. Potter. Thank you, Ms. McCarthy. Um, were you present in the Cobb County Superior Court on January 18th, 2019, when the defendant entered his plea? Um, when he was sentenced or when yeah. he entered? I'm sorry, when he was sentenced. When he was sentenced. I came in at the very, very end to hear the verdict and then I left. Okay. And were you aware of what the sentence was? Yes. What was it? Uh, 15 served 30. I'm sorry, 30 served 15. What were any were any parameters put on that? That he had two weeks before he was he had to report to get his affairs in order. Okay. Was he ordered to wear an ankle monitor? Yes. And were during during those two weeks, um, where was he living at the time? At his mother's house. And did you maintain communication with him during the, that two-week period? I did. Okay. How often did you see him? Um, I talked to him frequently during that time because he wanted to get some affairs in order and see the children and say goodbye to the children. And did he have the opportunity to say goodbye to the, the children? He did. Um, when was that? That was um, the Thursday night before, that was the night before the murder. Thursday night of that week, we met in a Starbucks parking lot and he said goodbye to both of the children. And did you have a key to Shirley Merritt's house? I did. Okay. Um, I went to discuss the events of February 1st, 2019. Did you see the defendant that day? I did. Um, where did you see him? I saw him at my daughter's appointment. She had an appointment with her neurologist um, early that morning, and he met us there at the appointment, which was unusual. And why, well, first of all, why was that unusual? Because for most of Mia's life, I went to all of her doctor appointments without him. And was it, Planned that you would meet him at the doctor's appointment that day? Yes, he said he was coming and he was going to meet me there and I knew that there was a chance that he was going to come. Okay. And did he in fact meet you there? He did. He got there a little bit late, but he did come. Okay. Where approximately is the doctor's office? Uh, Sandy Springs. Okay. And can you, I mean, is that off somewhere off 285? It's close off 285 near Children's uh, Scottish Rite Hospital that area. Who were you with that day? It was, I was alone with, with Mia, with our daughter. And about, do you remember what time the appointment was scheduled for? It was around 9 or 9.30 in the morning, something like that. Um, I don't remember exactly because of how much time it's been, but that was approximately the time of the appointment. Do you remember whether he met you there on time? No, he was late. Okay. Um, and do you remember about what time he did meet you? It was after the appointment had begun. Like I said, so much time has passed. I don't remember the exact time of the appointment, but it was nine-ish in the morning, and he showed up after we were already with the doctor and the appointment had started. What was he driving? Um, the Honda that Shirley had bought for him to drive while he was living with her. What color was that Honda? It was black. Okay. And can you describe his appearance that day? Um, he had a shaved head and a goatee. And is that his normal appearance? Is that how he normally? That's how he had looked for quite some time. Okay. And how did he act during that appointment? His demeanor was very strange. How so? Um, he didn't speak. He didn't look at anyone. He didn't talk to me or the doctor. Um, he had an aura of, it's hard to describe. He was either very angry or. And you know what, I'm not going to ask you to speculate as to how he 
was feeling. I'm just, I'm just, just what you. Observed. He was quiet. He was very quiet and didn't look at. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Okay. He was um, very quiet and didn't look at anybody or say anything. Okay. Did this seem unusual to you? Yes. Um, and did he ever say anything to you about turning himself in that afternoon? At that appointment, no, I don't believe he did. Did he actually go into where the appointment took place with you? Yes, he met me in there. And how long did the appointment last? It was very brief. It was a 10 to 15 minute appointment that was very routine. Um, and did, did you all leave the appointment at the same time? We did not. Okay, what happened? The doctor offered <laughs> Okay, without saying what was said. Right, right. We did not leave the appointment at the same time. I believe he left before me, and the doctor escorted me out to my car. Did you hear from the defendant after that? No. Okay. Did you ever talk to Shirley that day? I did not talk to her that day. When was the last time you spoke to her? The night before. And what was that conversation like? Um, well, she was upset uh, about the events. Um, and we had spoken for a couple of days about her making plans for Mike Jeffcoat to come and drive Richard to jail. Okay. And in your opinion, was that an appropriate plan? Yes. Why is that? Because Shirley was way too upset to drive him herself. Okay. Is... You knowing Shirley, is that something that she would have agreed to? Yes. Um, and after that, I'm sorry, you said that you last spoke to Shirley the day before January, the 1st of February, so um, uh, January 31st. Um, did you ever hear from her after that? No. Did you ever reach out to her after that? I did try to get in contact with her later in the afternoon on Friday. Okay, why is that? Um, I believe my son had a band concert that night that she was going to meet us at, and that's one of the reasons we were looking for her because we didn't hear from her, and we knew she was going to be there. Okay. So after, I wanna kind of talk about what happened after Mia's appointment. Um, did, did you leave and go home after that? Yes. All right. And what happened? In terms of hearing from Shirley or the defendant? I didn't hear from either of them again All right. at that point. Um, did you learn that the defendant did not turn himself into the jail as ordered? I did. When did you learn that? I learned that at 5.30, David Willingham, his lawyer, called me to see if I had heard from him because he did not report. Okay. And what did you do at that point? Um, gathered together with my family and went as fast as we could to pick up my son where he was at the band concert. Why did you do that? Because we were worried about him. Richard being missing and Jack being away from us. Okay. Wor what were you worried about? We were worried about what Rich might do. Okay. And did you, you said you reached out to Shirley. Do you remember about what time that was? We called her several times that evening. And who's we? We, um, me my, and my parents. And I don't know if Mike reached out to her, I'm sure. Okay, were you in communication with Mike as well? Not that day. Okay. Um, when did you talk to Mike? Um, Saturday, the next morning. Okay, and um, did you go to Shirley's house on February 1st? The day that she was murdered? Yes. No, I went to Shirley's house the next day. Okay, and what was the purpose of that? to check on her because we hadn't heard from her and we were very worried that something had happened. Okay. Did you, did you go with anyone? Yes. Um, my dad drove me to Shirley's house because I had the key and we met Mike Jeffcoat there. We met there together so that we could check on her because we were 
worried that we hadn't heard from her. What is your father's name? Salvatore Minicosi. Does he go by Sal? He does. And what happened when you met Mike Jeffcoat there? Um, we arrived at her house at the same time, and he said he offered to go in first, and I waited outside in the car with my father. What happened after that? Did, did, did you see Mike go into the house? I believe we were not... Mike called us. We were still in our car. Okay. And then Mike called us to tell us that she was dead in the house. And then he came outside and we talked to him. We saw him while he was waiting for the police. So were you in a vicinity where you could see the house? Yes, I was parked in the cul-de-sac right in front of the house. Okay. And did you see Mike check the doors to the house? Mike did that right before we had pulled up. We had been around the corner in the neighborhood. All right. And did you see any cars in the driveway? Um, the Honda that Shirley had bought for Richard was there. When you arrived at the house, do you remember, see, were you able to see whether the garage door was open or closed? Um, I don't remember. I was so upset at Shirley being dead in the house, I don't remember getting a look at the garage door. Okay. Tell me a little bit about that garage door. Um, how would you be able to open and close it? Well, with the remote, okay. with the, the remote or the button, just as usual. Okay. Was it one of those garage doors? I know that sometimes you can press the button and run out. <laughs> And, and it'll still close. Could you do that with that? No. Okay. Um, did, it, and so did, did you call 911 after learning that Shirley was dead? Oh, Mike did. Did you ever hear from the defendant that day? No. Okay. Did you work with the U.S. Marshal's office in their attempts to find the defendant over the next several months? Yes, extensively. Okay. Um, did you give them information about the defendant and where he might be? Yes. Okay. Did you have any idea where he was? No. Okay. Did you ever <laughs> hear from him in any, any way um, during the course of those months? No. And did he ever reach out to your children? During the time that he was missing? Yes. No. Okay. Do you recall when you learned that he was arrested? Yes. When was that? That was um, 3 o'clock on the date of his arrest. Um, the marshals called me to, and to tell me. What was your reaction? Um... <laughs> I know I started screaming, um, relief, extreme relief that he had been caught, um, finally. Why were you relieved? Because we were so scared during the whole time that he was gone that he might come after us or hurt us okay. because his behavior had been so scary at the time that we last saw him. Okay. I don't have any further questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are going to go ahead and take our lunch right now. I'm going to ask you all to please be back at 1 p.m. You will meet the deputy out in front of 7A at the other end of the hallway, um, just to make sure that you don't come into contact with any of the parties or witnesses in this case. Uh, please remember the instruction not to talk about the case or allow anyone to talk to you about the case. Uh, you're free to bring back any beverages that you want into the courtroom, uh, no alcoholic beverages, but um, anything that you'd like to have in the courtroom, you can bring back um, after lunch, okay? Have a nice lunch. See you all at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Ms. Minicosi, um, you're excused. Just don't discuss your testimony with anyone. Sure. Thank you.
Bring them in. Sure, um, we had the hearing yesterday regarding, or a couple of days ago, regarding the, the flyer that was placed in Ms. Cody Cody's mailbox. My understanding was that um, we were going to revisit that. I think that Your Honor was leaning toward letting in, but said that the defense had to connect the dots first. Well, I think they would do that once they have her on cross. If he's intending to um, introduce it through her. Yes, however, she has no direct knowledge of <clears throat> the flyer ending up in Shirley's mailbox. So I think it would be hearsay to <clears throat> allow that information to um, be admitted. Okay. I think she can say that she received it, 
but I, I'm going to object to them asking whether Shirley did. Okay. Well, if she doesn't have personal knowledge of that, she she can say so. Okay. okay. Anything else? No. Anything else? You know, when I'm asking these questions, it's, it's not a trick question. I'm just trying to make sure I don't have to keep sending them in and out. So, okay. All right. Okay, you bring the jury out. Why don't you ask Ms. Um, Manic Cozy to come back in, please? <coughs> Ms. Manicosi, you understand you're still under oath, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Queen. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> Good afternoon, Dr. Manicosi. Hello. How are you doing today? Fine, thanks. How are you? And then you and I, we know my person. We have chatted on a couple occasions, correct? We have. Okay. And Dr. Manicosi, let me draw your attention back to January 2019. Let's, let's talk about January 2019. Let's start there, and then we'll go backwards and forwards, okay? Now, back in January 2019, Basically, Richard's case was ongoing, and he was about to enter a plea, correct? Is that a yes? He, you mean right before he was, before his bench before, trial? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. And back in January 2019 and 2018, this fraud case up in Cobb County, it was a big deal, correct? Right. And it was a big deal because especially not only was it that it involved 34 counts, tens of victims, but it was in the county which you and Richard lived at the time, correct? Correct. And because I, I believe at the time you and Richard were living in Smyrna. Right. Okay. And it was a big deal because it also involved elderly people, correct? Right. And it involved the loss of hundreds of thousands of dollars, correct? Right. And, um, and at this time, tensions were kind of high up there in the area where you and Richard were living, correct? And I think some people even called it sort of like a lynch mob after your husband, correct? Yes. Okay. And leading up to the, him entering the plea, even though you and Richard weren't together, you were concerned and a bit nervous about the whole situation. I wasn't nervous about the situation. I was mortified that the whole world knew what I had been through. I wasn't scared. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me. But you were concerned, correct? Yes. You were concerned about the world and what they were thinking. Yes. Um, and then you were maybe a little concerned that maybe somebody was, or some person or someone was following you? No, never. And, then, and didn't someone come up to your job at some point in time regarding the case? Nobody came up to my job. When Richard was first arrested, one of the victims called and told my boss what he had done. 
I was never followed, worried about being followed or anything like that. It didn't bother you that people were calling your job to talk about your husband? It bothered me because I was embarrassed that the whole world knew what my husband had done. Rich and I were very prominently known in the community, so that's why it bothered me. I was never scared. I was mortified. Okay. And then, of course, I know on, on one occasion, you were at least somewhat concerned because you did get a flyer, a cartoon in your mailbox, correct? I remember the cartoons in my mailbox. Okay. And did you discuss those with Richard? Yes. Did you discuss those with Shirley? Yes. Okay. And to your knowledge, did Shirley get the same flyer? Objection, Your Honor. Again, this is a listening hearsay. It's a yes or no. I'm not asking what Shirley may have said. Okay. And to your knowledge, did Shirley get that same flyer? Yes, the flyers were put in her mailbox as well. Okay. So I'm going to show you what's marked as defendant exhibit number one. <laughs> Well, I did not see the ones that Shirley received. Fair enough. Is that the one this received? is the one that was in my mailbox. And the one you discussed with Shirley? With Shirley. Yes. You know, this time we move to the interview defensive number one. Hey, Jack. Hey, can I look at it for one moment, please? Oh, is this just a problem? Okay. No objection. That made it. I don't remember what day it was. It's been quite a while, but I do recall it was right before his bench trial, if I'm, cor if I'm correct in remembering that. Now you said bench trial. Was, was there a trial or was it actually the day in which there was a long sentencing hearing? The day of the sentencing hearing. I'm sorry, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if I'm saying the right thing. That's fair enough. You're a doctor. The, right. day, the day that he was sentenced. Mm -hmm. This was right before the day he was sentenced. Tune in January 18, 2019 for another edition of Georgia Cobb County Justice, Title Will. Flornoy picks again. Who's Flornoy? Never had any Flornoy's. That was the judge. And then this mention here of Judge, you never know I'm a repeat offender and I violated my bond while twice. I'm a bad, bad boy. I know you'll go easy on me. And and that was some of the, I guess, some of the language on the flyer. That's what I'm reading on the flyer. Okay. Then, of course, we have a comment here. Ask DA Margaret, hey, who cares about the elderly? Who take care of our own? How do I look with a hair piece? I'm such a tool. I guess that's some of the commentary with somebody from this flyer that you see. Yes. And there appears to be some comment here about. D.A. Reynolds, and also about the judge in the case. Correct? That's what I'm reading. Yes, and that's, that's what you see. Now, did that cause you, again, did it cause you any concern? I was not happy about it mm -hmm. because I didn't want the victims to confront me because I felt so bad that they thought I was an accomplice. Mm -hmm. I was upset that they knew where I lived because I was afraid they were going to try to talk to me and not accept my apologies for him. I was never afraid of them. I just thought, oh, they know where I live. Are they going to come talk to me? Just like Inside Edition was in my front yard and they were trying to talk to me, I didn't want to be involved in any way. So that's why I was unhappy that the flyers were in my mailbox. I was not afraid. Now, oh, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. But that day, 
Isn't it true that you took your son out of school that day? I don't remember. If I did take him out of school that day, it was probably because everyone at his school was talking to him about it and he was emotionally traumatized. Fair enough. And also, isn't it true that you contacted Cobb County Police regarding what was going on? I don't remember exactly um, if I told the police. Okay. And what about the Cobb County DA's office? Do you recall reaching out to them? Um, I had been in touch with one of the investigators at the Cobb County DA's office. And so I'm sure I talked to her. And you were in touch with her because you planned to offer evidence against Richard or, or because of your own concerns about being involved in any way? I was in touch with her all along because I tried to aid in his conviction. So I gave her his computer, some materials that were in the storage space of our house. I talked to her and gave her information about Richard to help with his conviction. I never talked to her because I was afraid in any way for myself or my family. And then as you, as you I believe you already told us, on the day in which Richard earned his plea, sounds like you weren't there for most of the hearing, correct? Right. You were there when he did, though, finally enter a plea of guilty and was sentenced to, I believe you said, 30 to 15, correct? Right. Okay. And you weren't there, but of course that day, Shirley was there. No, Shirley was not there. She wasn't there the day of sentencing? You sure? I don't remember. We're coming up on four and a half years. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't, I don't remember if she was sitting in the courtroom that day. I don't remember. Okay. And so let's talk about Shirley for a minute. As you mentioned, Shirley was a wonderful grandmother. Yes. As you said, Shirley cared about her grandkids immensely. Yes. And Shirley cared about Richard immensely also. He was her son. She did. Okay. She obviously cared about him. She was the only one that stuck by him. Correct. Because as you've told us, you and Richard met, I believe, around 94, correct? Right. When y'all were UGA, and then y'all got married around about 99, correct? Right. So we're talking 20 years in which you and Richard were together, 20 years in which Shirley was a part of not just Richard's life, but your life. Right. And during those 20 years, as you mentioned, Shirley gave not just to her grandkids, but she gave a lot to her son. Yes. Um, and oftentimes, you know, as, as a good mother, she helped take care of him when basically he couldn't take care of himself. Right. And as you said, when you guys were in school, I guess you were in school, he wasn't a lawyer yet. And it's, it's tough, basically, two rising professionals. And she gave money to you. Right. And, and as you mentioned, when Richard was trying to get on his feet, she gave money to help support his practice. Correct. She did a lot to help him, and they fought a lot in spite of that. And, and as you mentioned, she gave a lot, but it sounds like there was a, I guess, sort of an underlying understanding that she wasn't really looking for stuff in return. Correct? I don't think she expected him to pay her back. Correct. So, but then you mentioned that there were times, I believe your word was, they could be contentious. Yes. Um, now, is it fair to say, Shirley, she was a kind and gracious lady, but she was also a strong lady? She was a firecracker. Good way of putting it. And she could be, she was strong-willed. Yes. And your husband, he was kind of strong-willed also. <laughs> kind of. And the two of them, right, you said they could butt heads. Yes, they butted heads a lot. About simple stuff. About a lot of things. Oh, so many things. Okay. However, though they would argue, there never was any fights or any physical violence between either one of them, was there? There was never physical, never anything physical, no. Okay. And, and regardless of your feelings about Richard, he... Did not have a reputation for being a violent man, did he? No, but he had a very, very scary temper. Okay. But as you said, 
he did not have a reputation for physical violence, correct? He was physically violent with me once. Tell us about it. What year was that? I don't remember what year it was. It was somewhere towards the end of our marriage, the last couple of years, I do recall. But we had an argument and we were in our bedroom and he pushed me to the ground and I hit my head on the bed. And the, actually the two of you pushed each other? No, he pushed me and I hit my head. He pushed me down. I didn't do anything. And did you call police? No. Did you make a report? No, because I was scared of what he would do if I reported it. Did you file for divorce? Not at that time. Because you told us days after he gets arrested for fraud, within five days, you filed for divorce, correct? Because of what he did to me and to all those people that I found out about. Because pretty much he defrauded them, correct? And because of his actions, he took your life away. He ruined our lives. Correct. And that's why I divorced him. Because as, as you mentioned to us, you said that he was, you guys lived life as, I guess, during those 18 or so good years. That you live, you, I think your term was jet setters. Correct? We were a doctor and a lawyer. We were doing fun things. Absolutely. Doctor and lawyer traveling, correct? Yes. Having parties? Yes. Correct. Um, basically, you had the kids. I understand Jack was in football, correct? Sometime. Jack was in a lot of sports. He was in baseball, correct? Right. He was in fishing? Yes. He was doing golf? Yes. And doing a lot of that, his dad, Richard, was right there, correct? He was there for those activities. And then even with Mia, with her disability, often he would take her on walks, correct? He didn't do things with Mia as often. Didn't he go swimming with her? We would go to the pool sometimes and go swimming. He never assisted in her custodial care that she required as a disabled person. I did all of that by myself, and he never came with me to her doctor appointments except for the one on the day of the murder. I did much of Mia's care by myself. We went out to dinner, we did things as a family before the very end when his behavior changed, when he started drinking very heavily and showing us the temper that was very scary. Now, now you mentioned that, and I haven't seen a single report where you mentioned that that was an issue in your relationship, correct? I didn't talk about it because it was, it was very scary. It happened probably in the couple of months before he was arrested. And he told me later he knew he was about to be arrested because he knew he was going to get caught. And that was when he started coming home very, very drunk and angry. Um, his temper scared us very badly. There was one night where Jack and I were looking for somewhere to run and hide, but Mia was upstairs sleeping and we couldn't wake her up and we didn't want to leave her. Now, that is a good story. You've never mentioned that in any of the statements you made to the DA, correct? I told the DA that he was angry and had a drinking problem. You never mentioned that to the Cobb County DA, correct? I told them that he had a drinking problem. You never mentioned that to the judge in Cobb County, correct? To the judge in Cobb County? No, I don't recall talking to the judge in Cobb County. You mentioned it, never mentioned it to the Cobb County police when they came and spoke with you after the incident, correct? That he was, that he would drank a lot and had a temper? Yes, you never mentioned any of that to any of those persons up until you knew you would be called as a witness in this case, correct? I never mentioned it to anybody because it was so scary. And honestly, I blocked a lot of it out because I was so traumatized by everything that he had put us through 
And I was talking to Jack recently, and he reminded me of some of those events. Okay. So now you have, I guess, a recent recollection, correct? I've been working on it intensely in therapy, and a lot of the trauma that I've been through has surfaced later as I've dealt with the years of trauma that he put me through. Let me ask you this, Dr. Minkos. Back during the good days, pre-2018, you and your husband went to many events, correct? Correct. And during those times, during those many events, how would Richard introduce you? What do you mean? As his wife, as his yes. girlfriend, as Dr. Minicosa. How as would he introduce his you? Wife. As his wife, correct? Yes, I was his wife. He introduced me as his wife. And he would introduce you as being Dr. Minicosa, correct? Well, he would never call me, this is my wife, Dr. Minicosi. He would, he would say, tell this everybody is my you were wife, doctor. Janine. Yeah, he would tell people I was a doctor. He would tell people you were a doctor. And likewise, when you met people and you introduced them to Richard, he would say, this is my husband, Richard, correct? Yes. And you would say, this is my husband, Richard, he's, a, he's an attorney, correct? If people ask what he did for a living, sure. Right. Because like, like today, you mentioned to, to Ms. Ms. Pot here that uh, well, he became a lawyer after failing the bar two times. Three times. Right. Is that something you used to mention about your husband before all this? No, I didn't. But I mentioned it because she, Ms. Pot asked me what Shirley had done to help us and when she had given us money. And so I said that there was a while that it took him to pass the bar where we needed financial help and Shirley was the one to help us. That is the only reason I said it took him a while to pass the bar. And, and of course, you, one of the reasons is, let's be honest, at this point in time, you hate Richard. I t of course. Okay. Now, let's talk about Talk about that Thursday before the incident. You were telling us that you met up with Richard, uh, and you and, and Jack and me had met up with Richard that, that Thursday before, correct? That night we met in the Starbucks parking lot by my house so he could say goodbye to the kids. Well, also that night, isn't that, isn't that the night in which Richard and Jack went to Longhorns for dinner? Um, I believe they did, yeah. Okay. And then you and me had met up with Jack and Richard. At the, and had some Starbucks. Right. And he said goodbyes. We just met in the parking lot for him to return Jack to me, and then they said goodbye for the last time. Yes, that is what happened. And then that Friday, you mentioned to us how Richard had met y'all at the, the doctor's appointment, correct? Right. And you were aware that at that time, Richard was on that ankle monitor, correct? Right. And I'm not sure, were you aware that he had a... 8 a.m. curfew where you couldn't even leave the house for 8 a.m.? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I knew that, if I remember correctly. So, Richard's living in Stone Mountain with his mother. You can't leave the house till 8, and the appointment's up in Sandy Springs, correct? Right. And, and being a resident, a longtime resident of Atlanta, you know that's not a great commute on a, I guess, a Friday morning, correct? Right. Okay. Because you may mention that Richard was late. And that's not surprising that somebody would be late traveling that distance, right? We're all late when we try to leave at rush hour to go places. Okay, agreed. I didn't think that was weird. You didn't think it was weird? So you didn't think it was weird that Richard showed up late to the appointment up there in Sandy Springs, right? The fact that he was late is not what was weird about that appointment. Right, now you said Richard seemed different, correct? Yes. And of course, you know that's the day that Richard was supposed to be able to turn himself into jail and serve prison time, right? Right. And now you said he was different and he wasn't very talkative, correct? Right. But at the conclusion of that appointment, isn't Richard the one that took Mia to the car? That is not true. At the conclusion of that appointment, the doctor said, Janine, let me walk you to your car because he didn't like the way Richard's aura was and his behavior. So Mia's doctor walked me to my car 
out through the employee entrance and stood with me until we safely got in the car and drove away. Richard did not walk me to my car. The doctor did not allow it. You say Richard wasn't even there at that point in time? He went to wherever he had parked and left. Okay. I went alone with the doctor who insisted on escorting me to my car. And of course, at that time, you didn't call police, correct? No. You didn't make any type of report of him acting strange or being scared, correct? No, I knew he was about to go to prison <clears throat> and not be my problem. Now, you were, it sounded like you made, you thought that maybe um, Shirley had posted Richard's bond by putting up the house, correct? Yes. And as you said, you're not a lawyer, correct? No, I'm not a lawyer. And you weren't involved in that transaction at all, correct? No. And of course, it's not surprising you that actually he posted bond through a bond company, correct? Right. Okay. Because, of course, as you said, Shirley helped uh, facilitate him getting out of jail. She's, yes, she's the one who got him out of jail. I don't understand everything about how bonding works and how she came up with the money, but I know that Shirley is the one who got him out of jail, and she is the reason that he was bonded out. Correct. And you may tell us about that Friday. That Friday, that evening, you said Richard's prior lawyer, Mr. Willingham, contacted you because Richard hadn't turned himself in. He Correct? called me at work half an hour after Richard was supposed to have reported to see if I had heard from him. And, and I said no. And of course you hadn't heard from Richard. And at that point in time, I believe you told us that you did not reach out to Mike that night. You spoke to Mike the next day, correct? I believe so. It, we, were, we were very upset and concerned because Jack was not with us and Richard was missing. So I actually don't remember if I talked to Mike Friday night or Saturday morning. Like I said, we're coming up on four and a half years and there are some details of that day that I don't remember exactly. And it was all very stressful and traumatic. So just I'm just not entirely sure about some of those details. Okay, and now let's go back to like 2018. Richard gets arrested. And Shirley posts his bond, correct? It took a few months, if I recall. Mm -hmm. She gets him out on bond. He's on the ankle monitor. And during this time, the divorce is in progress, right? right? And during this time, you and Richard, I guess somewhat begrudgingly, are corresponding on a regular basis, correct? Out of necessity so that we could get divorced. Well, so you get divorced also so he could see the kids, right? I did let him see the kids. For quite some time, my son refused to see him. At first, Jack wouldn't see his father because he was too upset. But at some point in time, as you said, you facilitated Richard being able to see the kids weekly, bi-weekly on a regular basis, correct? I allowed that, absolutely. Because at that time, you didn't have concerns about Mia's or Jack's well-being, correct? At that time, I didn't know he was capable of murder, but at the time of his arrest in January 18, I didn't know he was capable of hurting elderly people. There was a lot I didn't know about him. Well, now you say all that, because obviously, as you've already told us, you hate Richard, but you don't know what happened, correct? I don't know what happened when. You don't know what happened with the criminal case in Cobb County, and you don't know what happened that day in Stone Mountain. The day of the murder? Correct, because you weren't there, right? No, I was not there during the time that she was supposed that she was murdered. Nothing further. Can you redirect? All right, so Janine, Mr. Queen described a lynch mob. Can you can you describe that a little bit further? They were not a physical lynch mob. They bonded together and they were very, very upset and angry and hurt. He was never afraid of them. He very often would say, No, I'm going to object. I'm just trying to hold on, define. Hold on, hold on. What's the, the basis of your objection? Because she has a hold on, off. hold on, Mr. Queen. Start over with the basis of your objection because 
Ms. Duhon can only take down one of us talking at a time, so I'm trying to make sure we have an accurate record. Sure, yeah. At this point in time now, the, the answer is not responsive to the question. And also, now she's speculating on his frame of mind. Ms. Pot, ask Your, a more specific question. Okay. I was confused about what you meant by lynch mob. Okay. Well, um, I am as well, and that's why I'm asking that question. Um, Mr. Queen used that term. Is that a term that you would use? No. How would you describe the victims of the defendant from the Cobb County case? Hurt and angry and upset and betrayed. And were, can you say what their average age was? They were older people. Okay. And were they in general business owners or, um, I mean, were these, can you go further and elaborate who these folks were? Um, they were ordinary people who needed help. Um, I don't know what they did for a living, but they were people that trusted him, that needed his help, that he hurt. Did you ever receive any threats after um, the defendant was charged in Cobb County? I was never threatened by anybody. Are you aware of any threats that the defendant received? No. Okay. And um, are you aware of any threats that Shirley Merritt or any other family member received? No, nobody was threatened. Okay. Um, and did anyone ever stalk you to your aware, to your base? Are you aware of ever being stalked? No, I wasn't stalked to my knowledge and I wasn't worried about it either. <clears throat> did you ever believe that you were being followed? No. Okay. And did the defendant ever mention to you that he felt that he was being followed? No. Okay. Did he ever express any fear of these individuals that he had stolen money from? No, he talked about them and said things about them, but fear was never a emotion that he conveyed. What did he say? He said a lot of them were crazy. Okay. And... And um, the cartoon, this cartoon that the defense has presented, um, is defense exhibit one. Do you consider any of this to be a threat? No. What do you consider it to be? I consider it to be the victims lampooning the whole situation. Um, you mentioned that the defendant had a scary temper. Can you describe what you mean by that? Rage. When he was drunk, he would go into a rage. Okay. And how would he act? Just screaming, cornering me, yelling, scaring the children. And you said um, that that was when he was drinking. Did he always drink? He always drank, and he always drank a lot. Um, we used to drink together during the days when we partied. I myself am in recovery, and I've been sober for a long time. Towards the end, and by the end I mean the time where he admitted he knew he was about to be arrested, he was driving home so drunk that he couldn't get out of his car once he got into the garage. Um, we would find him lying on the floor outside. Um, he was drinking to that extent. On the nights that he drank that much and he was able to come inside, he would be in a rage, screaming at us, and honestly just screaming about anything and everything. And how did he treat his mother? I would call him ungrateful to her for all the things that she had done for him. What do you mean? He fought with her all the time and was annoyed by her all the time and didn't act like he appreciated all the things that she did for him. She's the only one that stuck by him after his arrest. And did you... Um, 
did you ever witness him yelling at her or speaking in a demeaning way toward her? All the time. What kinds of things would he say? He would just tell her to butt out of his life and this isn't your business. And there's a, a lot of their interaction I wasn't witness to, but I was aware every time he was mad at her and he was mad at her a lot. How did you learn of the Cobb County charges? When the day that he was arrested on January 31st of 2018, I got a call from David Willingham, who's the lawyer that he hired, to let me know your husband's been arrested and this is why and this is what happened. Did you ever withhold either of the children from the defendant? No. Um, one additional question. Um, what kind of vehicle did Shirley drive? She drove the smaller Lexus SUV. It was gray. Okay. No further questions. Anything further this witness? Just briefly, Judge. Over 20 years, you knew Shirley Mary, correct? Yes. And you knew Shirley because of your husband Richard, correct? Yes. And, and you just characterize it, Richard was... He treated her as if he was ungrateful, correct? Yes. But I guess at the same time, likewise, I guess, didn't you treat her as if you were ungrateful also? Didn't I treat her as if I were ungrateful of her help? Because you benefited from all this help, correct? I did benefit from all this help, but I always thanked her. I didn't fight with her the way that he did. And then you were telling us that that period, right before Richard gets arrested, you said that his, his drinking had accelerated, correct? Yes. Now, you're aware that as a condition of his bond, he was on a monitor, correct? Correct. And also as a condition of bond that he had a curfew, correct? Right. And as a condition of bond that pretty much he wasn't allowed to drink alcohol, correct? Right. Okay. And then, let's... So during this time, that year, between his arrest and his sentencing, you see him on a regular basis, correct? I do. Because of the kids? Right. And that year, you see him, there's no interaction that caused you to say, no, you can't see my kids anymore, correct? I never prevented him from seeing the children. I didn't want to hurt my children, but, right, you're right. And during that year, between 2018 up until his, he pled guilty in 2019, he exhibited no actions that made you say, hey, you can't be around the kids anymore, correct? Right. Let me further. May the witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Queen? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. And, Your Honor, um, may we send a closing remain in the courtroom? Yes. Call your next witness. Yes, sir. It's Ashley Nelson. It's A S H L E I G H N E L S O N. Good afternoon, ma'am. Where do you work now? Now I work for DeKalb County Medical Examiner's Office. All right. How long have you worked there? Two and a half years. What are your duties with the, uh, the medical examiner's office? I investigate death scenes. Okay. Um, 
I take hospital calls, funeral homes. We work real close with. Sometimes I'll assist with autopsies. Okay. And uh, previously, before you worked there, um, where did you work? DeKalb County Police Department. Okay. And how long did you work there? About three and a half years. Um, what were your duties with the DeKalb County uh, Police Department? Uh, answering calls for service, appearances in court, um, obtaining warrants, that kind of thing. Okay. In February of 2019, what were your duties then? Uh, answering calls for service, 911 calls, uh, the same, going to court, uh, that kind of thing. Were you what's known as a patrol officer? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and were you working on February 1st of 2019? Yes, sir. And uh, that afternoon, were you on duty? Yes, sir. What were your duties that day? Uh, I was a patrol officer. Um, I was answering calls for service. I was working what's known as the 540s in Tucker Precinct, which includes smoke rice. Okay. Um, and what is a CAD? Uh, the CAD is the program that we use for our 911 calls. It shows up on our computers in our cars and it displays the notes and call times and everything. Okay. Um, and Your Honor, at this time the state would tender in States 8, which is the CAD and the business record certification for the 911 calls from uh, February 1st, 2019 and February 2nd of 2019. Any objection? No objection. Admit it. Um, investigator, what is a welfare check? A uh, wel welfare check is where we go to a residence or a business and we check on loved ones or even property we've checked on before. Sorry, Judge. Um, Mr. Nelson, I've shown you what's been marked as State's Exhibit A. It's already been in evidence. Do you recognize what this? Yes, sir. This is a copy of the CAD call. Okay. And was there a 911 call made on February 1st of 2019? Yes, sir. What was the call for? Uh, it was a welfare check. Okay. What time was the call made? The initial call came in at 17, 16 hours, 5, 16 p.m. Okay. Um, and at, at what time did you respond uh, to the residents? I was assigned the call at 5, 22 p.m. Okay. And what time did you get there? 5, 39 p.m. Okay. Uh, and can you just give the address? of the welfare check. 
1590 Planters Row. Okay. When you got uh, to the residence, what did you do? Oh, when I first arrived, uh, I walked up to the front door, rang the doorbell, knocked on the door. Okay. Uh, was the door locked? Yes, sir. All right. And uh, at this point, I'm showing you what's the mark of states. It's at five. Do you recognize what this says? Yes, sir. What is this? Uh, that is Miss Merritt's residence. Okay. Is that address in DeKalb County? Yes, sir. Right. Now, uh, so you went to the front door first? Yes, sir. Did anybody come to the front door? No, sir. What did you do after that? After nobody came to the front door, I walked around the house to check for any forced entry, open doors, or open windows. Okay. And did you come across any any doors that were open? No, sir. Did you check and see if all the doors were locked? Yes, sir. Right. Um, did it appear as though any windows had been broken? No, sir. Ms. Cass, I'll show you what's marked to State's Exhibit 11, State's Exhibit 78. Do you recognize those? Yes, sir. What are those photos of? Uh, the back of the residence. Okay. And are they fair and accurate? was one of the back doors on the back of the residence. Okay. Did you check this door? Yes, sir. Was it locked? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, State's Exhibit 11, what is this here? Another back door on the back okay. of the residence. Um, the residence. Do you see a door there? Yes, sir. Okay. Was the door locked? Yes, sir. And State's Exhibit 78, what is this here? Two more back doors on the okay. back side. Um, and did you check those doors as well? Yes, sir. And they were locked? Yes, sir. All right. Now, um, other than checking the doors, did you do anything else? After I checked the residence and everything was secure, I called my supervisor okay. and had him come out to double check the house with me. Okay. Did you also look into the house? Yes, sir. What did you, what did you see inside? Uh, normal living conditions there wasn't anything that appeared to really be out of place and the first door that you showed me I, put, um, I did see a purse you saw a purse? Outside. yes sir okay where was the purse it was sitting on a a, a table kind of like this one it looked like it was like a laundry room type area um let's go back to the cad real quick so looking at the cad you got there at what time Five thirty-nine. And is that in the afternoon? Yes, sir. What time did your supervisor get there? Uh, 7.27 p.m. Um, now, did you, did you only, did you and your supervisor only check on the house or did you look down the street, anything like that? I spoke to some neighbors while I was waiting for uh, my supervisor to arrive. Okay, was there any evidence that, that you had uncovered that there was any disturbance that had happened? Not that I saw, no. Um, looking at the cat here, how long, how long were you on scene at the house? A couple hours. I arrived at 5.39 p.m. My supervisor at 7.27 p.m. And it looks like we completed the call at 8.12 p.m. Okay. Now, if you had, um, what, what would you have had to have seen inside and, uh, to have gone into the house? We would have had to have heard something or somebody in there calling out for help would have been something, if I would have saw blood, if um, the house would have been in like a disarray, like it looked like there was a fight or something that happened prior to our arrival. Okay, but again, you didn't see any of that? No, sir. Okay. Now, at some point, you left? Yes, sir. Was there a call made the next day? Looking at the dad? Yes, sir, February 2nd. Okay. What, um, what time was the call made that day? 
9.28 a.m. Okay. And did officers respond that day as well? Yes, sir. Right. And uh, towards the cab, what time did the officers get on scene? The first officer arrived at 9.31 a.m. Or, excuse me, he arrived at 9.43 a.m., I'm sorry. He showed me. Now, uh, you mentioned the doors. What about the garage door? But the garage door was closed. It was closed? When I arrived, yes. Okay. And you said you spoke with the neighbors? Yes, sir. Based on your discussions with the neighbors, did it, did it appear as though it disturbed, that they had heard a disturbance? They hadn't heard anything, no. And uh, did you see any vehicles in the driveway? There was one car. You know what kind of car it was? I don't recall what kind of car it was. It was dark in color. I remember that. Dark in color? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 2.30. I'm sorry. 2.30 p.m. to uh, 1,200 hours, 12 midnight. 2.30 midnight. And the next day, what shift were you working? Were you working the next day? Yes, I worked the next day. It was the same shift, 2.30 to shift. midnight. Yes, sir. Because so, the next day, were you involved in this case at all? On the next day when she was found, I was. On the second? No, sir. You know, officer may have been on the scene. At that point in time, by the time you got off to on duty, this was no longer a case involving, I guess, regular patrol officers. It appears on the second they completed the call at five or three forty-four p.m., <coughs> which would have been after my shift started. But you wouldn't be called to the scene because by that time, other officers would handle this. Correct, not on the second. And you. Did you do a report to the officer on this case? No, sir. I did not do a report. And just for the jury's education, why did not do a report? Typically on welfare checks, we didn't complete reports. We would add um, notes to the call, which is what we did that night. We can, officers have the ability to add their own call notes to the CAD mm -hmm. from their cars, and that's what we did that night. Okay. Did you note the, the car in the CAD? It appears that I ran the tag number for the car that was in the vehicle, but it doesn't give what kind of car the maker model of the vehicle that was. As you know, you ran the tag, but you didn't make note as to whether, I guess, the car was a bigger to the maker model, right? Correct. Right. And I'm assuming you ran the tag, and if the car had been stolen, you would have noted that, correct? Right? Correct. Right. That the car had been stolen, which had been reported missing or anything, you would have noted that. Yes, sir. If there was like a photo for people to look out for this vehicle, we would know that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now let's let's go back and read. We went around the curtains of your house, and you said the doors you approached appear to be locked. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you looked through a window, and you noticed a purse. Yes, sir. Sitting on a table. Yes, sir. But there was nothing that seemed, I guess, extraordinary about that purse. Correct. It appears over. It was like the purse was laying over there, somebody right through the purse, anything like that. Correct. correct. The garage. You mentioned the garage door was closed. Could you see into the garage in any form of fashion? Yes, I could. And what did you see inside the garage? Do you recall? I don't recall. 
Thank you. Briefly, Judge. Mr. Nelson, yes, um, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 9. Do you recognize this here? Yes, sir. Where's that photo of? The house, and then there's a vehicle to the left. Okay. And is this a very accurate uh, depiction of what the driveway looked like with the vehicle? Yes, sir. Right. Your Honor, at this time, I will tender in States 9. Any objection? I guess I'll have a little more foundation as to the vehicle. So, you know, I'm going to check. What foundation? There's a little more clarity as to the, because obviously the photo is not taking the time that she was there. Um, the boom, boom, well, I'm going to check that. So, I think. Can you see what's happening? Is, is this a fair and accurate depiction of what the driveway looked like when you got there on February 1st of 2019? Yes, sir. Any objection? <laughs> Same objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that's about the driver. I think it was a trigger to note maybe the vehicle in the driver. Regardless, she described the driveway, and this is what the driveway looked like when she got there on February 1st of 2019. The foundation was laid for this photo to come in. Mr. Queen, I don't know what other foundation is necessary. She's identified the photo. She says it's a fair and accurate representation of what it looked like when she arrived at the scene. She's already testified there was a vehicle in the driveway. She just doesn't recall what kind of vehicle. I guess the only question is, is that the vehicle that she saw in the driveway? That's not what he asked her. He just asked her, "Does that is that a fair and accurate representation of what it looked like when she arrived? She said yes. That's all that's required. For foundation. I'll turn this in, Judge. All right. I'll admit uh, nine over objection. Thank you. Now, can you look at states nine? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what what kind of vehicle is that in the driveway? Uh, Honda Accord. <laughs> what color is it? It appears to be black. Okay. Now, was this the same vehicle that you saw when you responded on Friday, May, I'm sorry, Friday, February 1st? I can't say that that's the exact. Does it appear to be the same yeah, vehicle? It appears to be, yes, sir. Okay. Yes. I've never been Anything further this witness? I got this uh, simple question. Is that the car or not? Did you, you know or don't? I, I can't recall. I just dark and colored vehicle. No, sir. <laughs> May the witness be excused? Yes, sir. Mr. Queen? Yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Call your next witness. The seat calls Austin Burnett.
Yes. Austin Burnett, A U S T I N B U R N E T T. Um, how were you employed back in February of 2019? <clears throat> in February of 2019, I was a crime scene investigator for DeKalb County Police Department. What does a crime scene investigator do? So as a crime scene investigator, my role was um, primarily to document uh, crime scenes. Uh, we document through photography, video, uh, sketching, and evidence collection. Are you still with DeKalb County Police? No, I'm not. What do you do now? Uh, right now I am a high school teacher, uh, <laughs> teach math. All right, and um, are, did you, when did you leave DeKalb County? I left DeKalb County in September of 2019. Did you leave on good terms? Yes. And how long did you work as a crime scene investigator? Uh, total, uh, almost five years. And did you have any kind of training um, that would uh, allow you to be a crime scene investigator? Uh, yes. Specifically, what kind of training <clears throat> did you receive? Um, <clears throat> lots of training through the Georgia Public Safety Training Center. Um, basically, uh, classes that pertain to crime scene investigation, for example, uh, how to operate a camera, that class was called Basic Digital uh, and Photo Imaging. Uh, quite an extensive um, training in fingerprints. I have over 200 hours of training with fingerprint classes and a state certification along with that. Uh, and just uh, classes that generally teach you how to collect, preserve evidence, document crime scenes, and so on. And do you know about how many hours of training you, you received? I believe over 350 hours uh, total. All right. Um, when you are working as a crime scene investigator, specifically here in DeKalb County, um, mm -hmm. how are you made aware uh, of a crime that, if, that you need to respond to? So uh, typically uh, we are made aware <clears throat> um, when we're on call, which this case was, uh, we would get called by the uh, dispatcher. Uh, the dispatcher would then tell us that uh, a homicide detective has requested our um, presence, uh, basically that a homicide scene or assault case has occurred. Uh, so um, we would, they then relay the detective's contact information to us, which we'll then contact the detective and get all of our information about the case. Are you the first responder to the scene? No. Right. And do you work as a team? Yes. All right. Um, do you remember responding to 1590 Planters Row on February 2nd, 2019? Yes. Okay. Uh, about where is that located? It is in, uh, I can't remember exactly the city uh, that it's located in. I believe in Tucker. Is it in DeKalb County? It is in DeKalb County, yes. that being the location that you responded to that day? Yes, that is the one. And uh, uh, do you recall what time you responded? It was a little bit afternoon, I believe. Right. And were there officers on the scene when you arrived? Yes, there were. All right. Um, and was the scene secure? Yes. What does it mean to have a secure scene? A uh, secure scene basically means that uh, there are um, there's a heavy presence in this case uh, of basically law enforcement personnel that are ensuring that no outside personnel aside from uh, law enforcement personnel you know doing their duties can uh, go inside or outside the scene. Are law enforcement officers who respond to scenes trained on how to handle evidence? Uh, yes. Are they trained? To not touch evidence when they find it? Yes. Um, and when you responded, did you know anything about what the case was about? Uh, when I responded, I uh, got with the first responding officer to get all the case information. Uh, and the case, well, basically I got the information that it, a homicide had occurred. And um, when you, can you, can you just, Give a general description of what the scene consisted of. 
So um, when I arrived on the scene, basically I uh, saw uh, this house at 1590 uh, Planters Row, and it's just a large single family dwelling, um, and it had three stories in total inside the house. Um, and was it in the middle of a street, on the end of a street? It was in a cul-de-sac, I believe. Okay. I'm going to show you Steve's exhibits 9, 10, and 11. Um, Steve's exhibits... 9 and 11 are already in evidence, but I'm going to have you look at these. Um, could you describe what these three photographs are just generally? States Exhibit 9, 10, and 11 are uh, overall exterior digital photographs of the outside residents of the home. Uh, did you take these photographs? Yes, I did. Do they fairly and accurately represent the exterior of that house when you arrived there on February 2nd? Yes. Okay, at this time I'd move to admit Stacey's at 9. Hey, Jack. I, I think 9's already in. Right. I'm sorry, it. number 10 is the exhibit that I meant to, right. to any, tender. Any objection to 10? No, Admit it. When you responded to the crime scene, um, did you did you um, see any kind of signs of forced entry? Uh, not that I could tell, no. Do you recall how many outside entrances there were to the home? To the best of my recollection, I believe there were five entrances total to the home. Did you inspect them all? Yes. Um, and were officers going in and out of any particular entrance? We were primarily using the garage to enter the home. So when you got there, um, did you inspect all the other doors to determine whether they were locked? Yes. And were they? To the best of my recollection, yes. Okay. Um, and what about the windows? Were there any broken windows? There were not. Yes, it was. Did you run the tag? Mm, I did not, but I believe somebody else uh, on the scene did. All right. I'm just going to show the jury. States Exhibit 10 and States Exhibit 11. No. Can you, uh, did you process the interior of the house as well? Yes. Can you just give a general description of it? Uh, the <clears throat> general uh, description of the inside of the home, it was uh, very organized, uh, immaculately clean, um, and quite a lot of uh, rooms. The house was very large, uh, lots of square footage, uh, just basically lots of different rooms consisting of the home. Did you or one of your teammates create a crime scene sketch? Uh, <clears throat> the uh, other crime scene investigator assisting me on the case uh, created the sketch of the crime scene. What is a crime scene sketch? So a uh, sketch basically consists of measurements that we collect basically from wall to wall, door to door, and we'll be able to recreate uh, to scale what the, um, basically the interior of the home looks like according to our measurements. All right, I'm gonna show you Stacey's exhibits 12 and 13. Can you please describe for the jury what these items are? States exhibit 12 and 13 are both consist of the crime scene sketches that my uh, coworker created of the interior of the home. And do they fairly and accurately represent the interior of the home? Yes, they do. I'd move to admit Stacey's exhibits 12 and 13? Any objection? Mm -hmm. Admit it. Uh, Mr. Burnett, I'm going to ask that you remove that. Okay. All right. 
This is State's Exhibit 12. What portion of the house is depicted here in State's Exhibit 12? So this is the uh, main floor uh, to the uh, residence. Front door to the home is right here. Oh, that is working. All right. And where is the garage? The garage uh, entrance to the garage is right here. Can you just draw a little bit larger oh. so it's kind of hard to see? Or circle it maybe? Okay. And where is the garage door that uh, a car would drive through? Uh, the garage door would be right here. Uh, that would be where the car would drive uh, into the garage. And where is the kitchen area? The kitchen is this whole area right here. All right. And looking at this, we see the X on the bottom. Is that as if we're looking from the street? Yes. Yeah, this, would, um, this is oriented as if we were uh, looking at it from the driveway, from the street. Yes, I did. I'm going to show you State's Exhibits 14 through 45, as well as 86 and 87. Yes, I did. If you could just flip through them and in general, um, tell the jury what they are. <clears throat> so all of these photographs um, are basically depict the interior of the home. So just basically the showing the general conditions uh, that the home was found in as I arrived on the scene. Yes. I'm going to start um, with exhibits 14 and exhibit 15. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you aren't this time. I apologize. I need to admit states exhibits 4. Any objection? No objection. Admitted. Sorry about that. I got a little ahead of myself. All right. You discussed the the doors um, to the home, and I'm going to show you to exhibit eight. So this is the um, door jam of basically the uh, garage door. And what about State's Exhibit 15? What is that? And that is the uh, correlating uh, door jam to the, the frame of that garage entrance. Okay, and were there any signs of forced entry? Not that I could tell, no. Okay. And what about the other remaining doors? Did you check those doors for forced entry as well? Yes, the other remaining doors did not appear to be forced open either. From what I recall, yes. Okay. And through what door did you gain entry into the house? From the, uh, 
from the garage entrance. Okay, is that what we're looking at at stages of 14 and 15? Yes. And um, what is the area to the left of the stairs when you enter? To the left of the stairs, I believe it is a laundry room. Yes, uh, that uh, doorway uh, leads into the laundry room. And looking again at State's Exhibit 12, um, where is that located when you look at this exhibit? So I was positioned about right here when taking that picture. So there's still the um, area you can see about right here where there appear to be like a desk and then the entrance to the laundry room going forward. All right, I'm gonna show you what I marked states at 46. <clears throat> What is this item? It is a uh, brown Michael's Kors purse. Okay. Is that, in fact, um, something that you found in the house? Yes. Okay. And where did you find that? It was on the chair. That was um, basically... Uh, pulled out of that little desk area uh, right between basically the garage entrance and the laundry room. Do we see that purse um, here in State's Exhibit 6, which is being published right now? Yes. Okay, and um, is it in the same or similar condition as it was um, when, when it was discovered that day? Yes. I moved to admit State's Exhibit 47. 46. Any objection to 46? Okay. Admit it. Um, Mr. Burnett, if you could open up that purse for me. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me give you some gloves. Yes, there is. And can you remove it, please? And open it up? Are there financial documents in that wallet? Uh, there appear to be s <coughs> several uh, receipts and other financial documents, yes. And what about a driver's license? Yes, there is. And whose driver's license is that? The driver's license of Shirley Merritt. Okay. And what about credit cards? Are there any in there? Yes, there are. And looking in there, do you see any checks? Not that I can see off of just looking through here. Yes, okay, yep, there are checks in here. Is, are there blank checks in there? Yes, there is. Okay, and what about um, any other financial documents in that purse? Yes, there are um, several financial documents. Okay, is there a checkbook in the purse? Yes, <clears throat> yes, there is. Okay, and what is the name on the checks in that checkbook? The names on the checks are Shirley Merritt. Um, did 
did you process the kitchen? Yes, I did. So <clears throat> in States Exhibit 17, this is a overall photograph uh, just showing the area of the dining room. From this perspective, the kitchen would have been right behind me, uh, but it shows the uh, dining room as well as the stairs leading up uh, to the upper floor. Was the table set like that when you responded to the crime scene? And if you were to look at States Exhibit 18, that shows, is it better photograph? Yes, it was set just like that. In the kitchen, um, immediately uh, we noticed on the island of the kitchen, there were several documents, uh, basically like a birth certificate, uh, among other documents, with the name uh, Richard Merritt, I believe. And on the kitchen counter, uh, there, were, uh, there was a knife block that had, been, uh, that had two slots where two missing knives were from that knife block. As, and basically just in the kitchen uh, overall, there were pots and pans um, that were in the middle of creating or cooking a meal. Uh, basically one was filled with pasta, another was filled with sauce, uh, there was a salad bowl. So it was in the middle of basically preparing a meal. So <clears throat> the placard that uh, labels evidence number one, those are the documents that I uh, mentioned before, where uh, basically just uh, like a birth certificate, of, among other documents, to Richard Merritt. Okay, so you said that the what is this item? That is the. Did I hold it? Yes. Okay. So this is a uh, legal document and contains um, basically from Virginia. And it contains the uh, birth certificate of Richard Merritt. Okay, is that in fact the item that is marked by exhibit one and not photo, or I'm sorry, by the number one placard in the photograph that we're looking at the screen? Yes, this is the same item. And has it been altered in any way? No. All right, I move to admit states exhibit 47. No objection. So the um, evidence placard number two was intended to mark the knife block. was not anywhere in the kitchen, no. Um, what did you find regarding these pots and pans on the stove? The pots and pans uh, contained food items um, such as pasta, sauce. <clears throat> um, did that pasta appear to have been cooked? It did appear to be cooked, yes. Were the pots and pans, were, I'm sorry, was the stove on when you arrived? No, it was not. Okay. And can you, do you have any idea, did it look like that food had been there for a long time? No, it was expectation. Your Honor, I, I think you can testify as to the quality of the food. I think that's common knowledge. <coughs> okay. Um, was the food cold? Uh, it did appear to be cold, yes. There was no steam um, rising from it at all. And um, what about what we see here in State Exhibit 
Yes, um, the on the island uh, on the opposite side consisted of a basically salad bowl as well as a dish uh, containing fruits. And I misspoke. This is actually Exhibit Twenty Six. Um, and then Exhibit Twenty Seven, which is the Exhibit Yes. Yes. It was right here at the bottom of the stairs leading to the basement. front entrance to the home, uh, leading from this door right here. Uh, there is, um, in that same area, you can go pretty close by to the staircase that leads down towards the basement. Yes. What can you can you describe what it appeared like to you? Well, I mean, what what you saw on Julie Merrick's body? So, uh, just upon initial examination, she was uh, lying on the ground on her left side. Uh, it appeared that just looking at the back side, uh, there was dried blood from what appeared to be a cut, uh, and. That's all I could initially tell without uh, tampering with the body before the medical examiners arrived. Did you ever touch Shirley Merritt's body? No. Um, and what is your responsibility when a deceased person is found on a crime scene, as a, as a crime scene investigator? So again, uh, in crime scene investigations, we are um, primarily there to document the scene. So as even when the uh, decedent is found, we are still there for the documentation purposes of it. For uh, moving the body, uh, that would be the medical examiner's office uh, and the medical examiner's investigators that arrived to the scene. Okay. And in this case, did the medical examiner arrive on the scene while you were there? Yes, they did. Did you take photos both before and after Ms. Merritt's body was removed? Yes, I did. This is a photograph that shows um, the same area that the decedent was lying in, and uh, it was a photograph taken after um, she was removed from the scene. Um, Investigator Burnett, did you take photographs of Shirley Merritt's body after the medical examiner rolled her over? Yes, I did. Okay, I'm gonna have you look at State's Exhibit 28. And does that show what was found when Shirley Merritt's body was turned over? Yes. And can you describe what her face looked like? <clears throat> so in the um, right side of her face, uh, there was a um, knife blade from a chef's knife protruding from it. Uh, on the left side of her face, there were uh, basically blood tumors from where it looked, appeared as if she sustained heavy trauma. And there were um, several areas of just blood and bruising all around her face. Um, can you 
said that there was a knife blade protruding from her face. Did you collect that knife blade? I did not collect the knife blade. Um, to the best of my recollection, it was transported with the body to the medical examiner's office. I'm going to move on to State's Exhibit 30. Um, what is marked here as State's Exhibit 3 and 4? I'm sorry, as, as your placard was number 3 and 4. So, uh, evidence marker labeled number 3, uh, labeled a uh, black handle or a hilt to a knife. And evidence marker number four, labeled a 35 pound dumbbell. Can you say approximately how close to the deceased those were located, those were? I believe about four feet approximately. Looking at States Exhibit 31, did that, did you collect that item? Yes, I did. I'm gonna show you Can you please remove that item and uh, take a look and tell the jury what it is? This was that um, <clears throat> knife blade that was labeled as evidence marker number three, or sorry, not the knife blade, but the hilt uh, to the knife that was labeled evidence marker three. And is it in the same or similar condition as it was when you collected it that day? It appears to have been processed uh, after I collected it. What do you mean processed? So from what I can tell just by looking at it, uh, it does look like uh, super glue has been adhered to this knife hilt. Uh, that is a standard procedure to process for fingerprints. Okay. Otherwise, does it appear to be in the same condition? It otherwise would be in the same condition, yes. Okay, and is it in the packaging that you sealed back on February 2nd, 2019? Yes, it is. Okay. Your Honor, at this time, I move to admit State's Exhibit 48. Any object? Admit it. Um, did this item appear to be of a size that would match the blade protruding from the Smith's face? <clears throat> it very well could match uh, the blade to the hilt, yes. And looking back at State's Exhibit 23, did it appear to be the same size and shape as if it had come out of this knife block? The hilt uh, was consistent as far as size and shape of coming from that knife block, yes. State's Exhibit 32 represents a photograph of the 35-pound dumbbell that was labeled as evidence marker 4. Uh, you can tell um, on the left side of the photo, basically on the left to the numbers 35, uh, there was suspected blood on that dumbbell. So this is the 35-pound um, dumbbell that you can see in the photo. Is it in the same or similar condition as it was when you collected it that day? Yes, it is. Okay, and is it in the packaging that you placed it in? Yes, it is. I'm going to admit states to the 50. 50 or 49? 49. 
<clears throat> yes, I did. I don't believe so, no. Um, and you have in this photograph, kind of in front of these two baskets, a, a placard with the number five on it. What is that marking? <clears throat> Evidence marker number five um, was labeling a indention in the carpet that it appeared as though the matching set to that 35 pound dumbbell, uh, it basically appeared that the 35 pound dumbbell had been moved from that location. It appears to have been, yes. Were there any signs of struggle in the basement? No signs of struggle that I could see, no. What about in the stairwell where Shirley Merritt's body was <clears throat> um, Just aside from that area right directly where she was, um, no sign of the struggle. Did you process, oh, and was there, well, was there any blood? In the remainder of the basement um, or that stairwell, aside from where she was, uh, no blood. Did you process the remainder of the house? Yes. What was the condition of the remainder of the house? <clears throat> so the remainder of the house was uh, more or less the same as I've described it earlier. Uh, it was very well organized, uh, lots of um, you know furniture. Uh, every bedroom was well furnished. Uh, everything was immaculately clean. Uh, the whole house basically looked very clean and organized. I am going to scroll through States Exhibits 36 through 46 so the jury can see. Was there any overturned furniture throughout the house? There was not, no. no blood or suspected blood that I could see through the remainder of the house. Did you see any valuables in the house? Yes. What valuables did you see? <clears throat> um, electronics as far as TVs, um, you know, furniture that was furnished in every room. Uh, there were um, dishes in a china cabinet. Um, several items of that could be considered valuable were throughout the home. No damage to the walls or shelves of the home, no. And throughout the home, were there any signs of a struggle or a fight? Not that uh, we could tell. There were no signs of a struggle or fight throughout the home. Did you find any other weapons in the house other than the knife and the dumbbell? Uh, no other weapons, no. Okay. Um, and what about cell phones? Did you find any? There were no cell phones that we found in the house, no. I have no further questions. Mr. Queen, before we begin with Cross, we're going to take a short recess. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a break for about 10 minutes. Mr. Barnett, you can step down, just don't discuss your testimony with anyone. Small, but they're like. 
You may be seated. Go ahead, Mr. Queen. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, Mr. Burnett. Good afternoon. Let's see, Mr. Bet Burnett, back in 2019, you were working for the Cab County Police Department, correct? Yes. And back then you were assigned to the CSI division, correct? Correct. Crime scene investigation. Correct. Now, CSI, is that like CSI on TV? Uh, not at all, no. Tell the jury how it's not like it is on TV. <laughs> So, for example, on TV, uh, I watched an episode once where they pulled a perfect fingerprint, I mean, full detail, <laughs> and then 
instantly ran it and the system found a match without any work needed. <laughs> the uh, actual process is a lot more complex than that. Um, so a lot of the details are basically exaggerated. Uh, it's a lot more timely to get results basically based on, you know, uh, lab tests and so on. Okay. And on CSI, on the, on the TV show, those guys do everything. They investigate the scene, they go out and catch suspects, all that good stuff. Were you, are you involved in determining suspects or finding suspects? No, no, no part of the, basically my job is purely objective, not subjective. So all I do is look at the evidence and that's, that's it. Now in this case, on February 2nd, it looks like you arrived there about 1231, is that correct? That sounds about right, yes. And obviously by the time you arrived, it was an active crime scene, correct? Yes. And by the time you arrived, there were, other, there were police officers on scene? Yes. Um, there were uniform officers of various degrees and levels in the police force, correct? Yes. And there were also detectives on scene, correct? Correct. And those detectives, were they assigned to the homicide unit? Yes. Okay. Now, when you arrive on the scene, do you take over the scene Go to the CSI person? So the crime scene is delegated to us. Uh, it is the main responsibility of us to um, process that crime scene, although it is a team effort as well. Okay. Now, you say the team... You, along with other people who were actually there with CSI that day, correct? Um, yes. Because I believe on that particular day, also CSI Lester was with you. That is correct, yes. CSI Lester was also a crime scene investigator at the time. Correct. And on that particular day, you were the senior and they were the junior? Not necessarily senior, junior. Um, we kind of label it as primary, secondary. Uh, we're, we actually started on the exact same day, so we were on uh, equal footing for sure. Um, but basically the primary is delegated to take the photographs and collect the evidence of the scene, whereas the secondary is delegated to do the sketch and do a digital recording of the scene. Like particularly in this case, we have a diagram, and the diagram has H. Lester at the bottom. And that was, that was part of Lester's duty, right, in order to do the diagram? Yes, that's correct. The diagram is done, basically take measurements on scene, correct? Yes. They do like a rough sketch on scene, correct? Yes. And then often they go back to the, I guess, the office and do a nice, more formal, prettier diagram. That is exactly correct. And that's yes. what happened in this case? Yes. Okay. Um, but as you mentioned, you being the primary, a lot of your duties involve taking photographs. Yes. And in this case, um, Ms. Peter, Ms. Pot asked you about processing and processing that's prim that was primarily taking photographs correct in this case primarily taking photographs and collecting the evidence yes okay. and collecting the evidence and again let's, let's talk about the evidence for a moment there are a few placards in the house and in the placard we got evidence placard one and looks like we have the birth certificate which you've already been introduced correct yes and you recall that there was also a large envelope on the kitchen counter with other various items inside, correct? Um, <clears throat> looking, um, kind of reviewing what that item was, it appears that the birth certificate was basically attached to two other documents in that same kind of enclosure. Okay. And then evidence two, that's the, the block where we see the, the kitchen knives. Correct. And as you know, it looks like it appears all this, uh, I think it was, was it six or eight? I think it was eight, and one was missing, correct? I couldn't recall to the number, but the top left, uh, where the chef's knife would go, that was the missing one. Correct. And evidence three, that's the black knife handle which you find downstairs. Yes. Okay. And evidence four, that's the dumbbell, which you have right there in front of you, correct? Correct. And evidence five, it looks like that's the placard where you have the area adjacent, where there appears to be an impression in the floor um, presumably, possibly from the dumbbell, correct? Possibly, correct, yes. And that's, that's why you took the photo, because you said, oh, there's an impression in the floor, dumbbells are heavy, 35 pounds in this case, and it's likely caused that impression in the floor. Correct. Oh, my apologies. I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, trying to stay awake this afternoon. I'm just talking too fast. I apologize. And so those are the placards in which um, you noted for us, correct? Yes. And we have oh, about 20 or 30 photos 
But that's not the full extent of the photos you took, correct? Not the full extent, no. Because obviously this was, as you said, a large house. Yes. We're talking a house in excess of 5,000 square feet. Is that fair to say? Fair to say, yes. And multiple, many, many bathrooms, many, many bedrooms. Correct. And many, many common areas also. For sure, yes. For sure. <laughs> and so we have a portion of the photographs. And you took photos of that door which leads from the, the garage, I guess, up to the, I guess, to the laundry room. Correct? Yes. Okay. And did you take photos of the rest of the doorways? Not that I recall, no. Um, we observed that the, to the best of my recollection, uh, once we entered through the garage, we observed that the rest of the doorways were locked uh, and that there didn't appear to be any damage to the frame or the door jam from the outside and inside of the house. So we didn't, um, not that I recall, open those doors. Okay. Now, that doorway leading from the garage into the house, you took photographs of it, did you do any other processing of it? No other processing of it, no. And particularly, did you examine the doorknob, the door jam, the, the lock strike, or any items for fingerprints? We um, did not dust them for fingerprints, um, just uh, for the sake that basically at that point, uh, the first responding officers had entered the home, the detectives had entered, um, the um, family member that found the decedent also entered. Uh, so basically the judgment call on that, uh, we call it overlapping matrices uh, as far as fingerprints go. So basically as so many hands touch the doorknob, uh, basically there's gonna be so many overlapping of the friction ridges that consist of the fingerprint that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to, to basically get a clear fingerprint off of that doorknob. Did you even attempt it? It was not attempted, no. Okay. And likewise, I guess for the same reason, no one attempted to take any DNA from that particular area, the door, the doorknob, the walls around there. Uh, for that same reason, yes, because there would be multiple DNA profiles. What about in the kitchen area, around that block, though? Were there any, anyone try to get any DNA or fingerprints from around that, that kitchen block, where presumably the knife was taken from? There was not any um, DNA or fingerprints taken from the kitchen area either. Okay. Um, in the downstairs area, downstairs, like along the, the walls, because basically there's a, we're talking the staircase, it goes down, and then we have Ms. Merritt found there <clears throat> at the bottom. Along the rails or the walls, was any fingerprints or DNA or anything taken in that area? No. Um, in in that area, no, there were not any fingerprints or DNA taken okay. along the walls, you said, right? Yes, sir. That's it. Right. So, yeah, no um, DNA or fingerprints taken from that area. Okay. So, but you mentioned to us, and we have it for you, the knife handle and also the dumbbell. And those items, how were, how were they preserved? <clears throat> evidence, values. So the uh, knife block was packaged in a paper bag and the uh, dumbbell was also packaged in um, several layers of paper bags because of the weight of it so that it wouldn't bust through. And the purpose of that is to prevent cross-contamination so that as long as there's basically a barrier from the inside to outside, nothing can contact the item on the inside of that bag. That is how we typically go about preserving evidence. Now, on scene, I believe it's, given what you told us, I assume you're wearing gloves, right? Yes. And on scene, did you attempt to get any DNA or fingerprints or anything like that from those items? Not from those items, no. Um, what the judgment call on while we were on the scene, what we had decided as a team, was that we would preserve the items to send to GBI for testing. We would, um, we wanted to, more so, um, it is best practice to send them the entire item rather than just a swab of it. So that way GBI can do all sorts of additional tests rather than basically they have the whole item as compared to just a little swab of an area. Now you say as a team, who's, who's a part of this team? 
primarily um, ourselves, my, uh, myself and Investigator Lester, as well as the homicide detectives. Um, Detective McQuilkin was one of the um, main detectives that worked with us on the scene. Now, let's talk about a couple other things in which uh, you took photographs of, you may have even collected. There was a, I understand it was an Apple iPad with a purple case, you call that? Yes. And what was done with that item? The, that item was um, seized during the search warrant. Uh, so uh, Detective McQuilkin actually, I photographed it and documented it, but Detective McQuilkin collected that item. Okay. Also understand that it was an Apple iPad with a black case and charger. Likewise, that item collected? Exact same scenario. Uh, I documented it and Detective McQuilkin collected it. I believe also there was a Kindle with a black case. Was that also collected? Kindle with the black case. I would have to refer to my report to make sure that was also part of it. I can approach Judge. Yes. Yes, there was a Kindle with a black case collected, um, documented by myself and collected by McWilkin as well. Okay. And likewise, do we have, um, recall collecting some letters on top of the nightstand? Yes, the handwritten letters. Do you recall collecting a laptop? A the, laptop? Yep, the laptop as well. All of those uh, were also collected by McQuilkin. Okay. Now, when you say those are collected by McQuilkin, do they remain in his custody or do they go to someone else's custody? So at that point, he would... Um, would be responsible for the custody of it entirely as far as the packaging, uh, the transportation, making sure that it is free from cross-contamination as well as um, other personnel getting their hands on it. So he would be entirely responsible for those items. Now, those particular items, to your knowledge, um, was any preliminary testing done on the scene, again, for fingerprints or blood? Um, not for those items, no. Okay. I mean, DNA? I do not believe so, no. Now, you tell us about the dumbbell and the possible impression left in the carpet downstairs. We call that? Yes. And because primarily the upstairs area, there was a lot of hardwood. There was some, some marble tile. There was also some carpet. But primarily downstairs, it was carpeted area, correct? Primarily, yes. Okay. Now, so when you were downstairs and you saw that impression that the dumbbell um, may have left, did you take the time in order to do any footprint impressions to see if there was a particular shoe that may have caused or walked from one room to the other? We did examine the carpet entirely for other such impressions, um, but we did not see any, any impression that would resemble a shoe print or anything of the sort. Just that was the only one that um, stuck out, so that was the one that was documented. Now, you noted on the second that it appears as though that there was not just blood, but hair on the floor. Correct? Hair on the floor, you said? Mm -hmm. In the basement area. In the basement area. I believe it would have been hair in that general area where the decedent was found. Okay. Because it looks like you noted 35-pound dumbbell with suspected blood and hair. Yes, okay, so the hairs were on the dumbbell. Basically, um, they were, so where the blood was on the dumbbell, there were also hairs that were basically embedded in that dried blood. And those particular hairs, how were those processed by you? So uh, as far as um, what we were able to do uh, at Gap County Crime Scene, we did not have the capabilities or the training to um, test those hair samples. So what we were mainly responsible for was preserving them so that we could send it to GBI where they have the capability to then test it. So just like routinely out of all of our other evidence, we would make sure that it's free from cross-contamination so that nothing could tamper with the evidentiary value of it, and it would then be sent to GBI. And from what I see here, it looks like that you were there on scene to about 342, does that, that sound correct? That sounds about correct, yes. About three hours and some change? Yes. 
Now, was that the extent of your involvement on February 2nd? I believe I took some uh, follow-up photographs of the evidence that I collected. Um, but as far as the that day for the original scene, that was the extent of my involvement on that day. Okay. And you just lay right to where I'm headed. Do you recall around about February 26, taking some follow-up photos? February 26th. If that's the date on the report, yes. Okay. And when you took follow-up photos, where were you? In the um, uh, in our lab area uh, of the um, crime scene unit. And at that particular time, what were you tasked with doing? At that particular time, we basically in case that um, the photographs didn't turn out clear or anything like that, uh, basically, or if additional photos were needed. Uh, we would take basically additional photos from all angles in the lab just to make sure that every uh, bit of it was documented. Now, the additional photos appears though you took photos again of the birth certificate and the paperwork. Yes. And it looks like you also took photos of that, that knife handle, correct? Yes. And also pictures of that 35-pound dumbbell with the suspected blood and hair, correct? Yes. So on that second time when she processed those items, at that time, did you do any swabbing or smears or attempt to <clears throat> fingerprints? At that time, it was um, already decided that the items would be going to GBI, and they it's it's a preferred um, policy that we don't tamper if we if it is being sent to GBI to basically not mess with it at all on our end, so that way GBI can have it tamper proof and they can basically start their processing from ground zero. So to your knowledge, after February 26, were you involved with DKPD in the processing of any of these items? No, I was not. Nothing further, thank you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. May the witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, your next witness. I, uh, Your I do. My name is Jesse Worley, J E S S E W O R L E Y. Good afternoon, Ms. Worley. Good afternoon. Um, where do you work, ma'am? I work at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation in the Division of Forensic Sciences or the Crime Lab in the Impressions Evidence section. And your title there, what do you do? Um, my title is a crime lab scientist, and I am signed off to do latent print and footwear casework. Okay. Um, and your duties with the GBI, uh, can you describe them? Yes. Um, so as a latent print examiner, our section accepts evidence from crime scenes that they've processed for latent prints or fingerprints. Uh, we also accept items of evidence that need to be processed to develop fingerprints on them and we conduct comparisons to known fingerprint exemplars and do database searches on the state and federal fingerprint databases. And what's your education? I have a bachelor's of science in forensic and investigative sciences from West Virginia University. Okay. And in order to become a latent print examiner, um, what kind of training do you have to have? Uh, I completed the GBI's training program for latent prints and for footwear. Um, both training programs are about two years long. They cover all the topics we need to know to do the basic 
um, analysis for casework, as well as the history of the discipline, and then also um, we cover competency testing and then um, report writing. Yeah, I can approach. I just I asked about your training um, and how long have you done this work? I was hired at the GBI in 2007 and started working fingerprint cases at the very beginning of 2009 and then went through footwear training in 2020 and just finished that up last year but I've continued to work fingerprint cases basically the last 15 years. All right. Approximately how many fingerprint cases do you think you've worked? A lot. Um, it's in. I, I've averaged about twenty cases a month since I started working cases. All right. Um, and have you ever testified as an expert? I have. How many times? Today we might be seventy-three. Would be seventy-three. Okay. And your honor, at this time we would move to admit uh, Miss Worley as an expert in latent print examination. Any objection? Oh, no. She will be so recognized. All right. Did you did you prepare a report for this case? I did. Okay. Now, when the GBI gets a case, what happens on the front end? Um, any evidence that comes into the GBI, the agency that's submitting it is required to properly package and label their evidence and fill out a GBI evidence submission form to turn in with the evidence so that we can open and generate a case in our system so that we can track all of the items of evidence and the requested testing services. Um, we also track the chain of custody for each item as it moves throughout our laboratory system, and that's where we generate our reports. Okay. And um, for this case, was, was like a number created? Yes. So every case that comes in from an agency is given a unique GBI or uh, Division of Forensic Sciences um, case number, and then each item is numbered and tracked with that case. All right. And for this case, can you just say what the case number was? The DOFS case number was 2019-100-5039. All right. Okay. Now, uh, as it relates to latent print examination, did the GBI receive any items for that? Yes. What, what was received? Um, the item that was submitted with a request for latent print processing was a seal package containing a black plastic knife handle. Showing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 48. Some gloves here as well. Thank you. Can you um, look through that item and uh, say what that is? Yes. Do you recognize that? I do. What is it? This was the knife handle that was submitted from um, DeKalb County to be processed for latent prints. Okay. Um, and how, how do you know that it's the same item? Um, when we enter cases at GBI, everything gets barcoded. The barcode label has the case number, and then each item has its own unique item number. In this instance, um, States Exhibit 48 appears as item four in the crime lab um, reporting system. And then I also hand wrote um, and dated on the package as well as the item itself. Okay. Now, obviously, it's been open today, but when you got it uh, for testing, did it, appear that the, or did it appear that the item had been tampered with? No. Okay. Um, now, what were you asked to do with the item? Um, the item was submitted with a request for latent print processing, okay. which means that we would attempt different chemical or physical detection methods to try and develop fingerprints on the surface of that item. Okay, and can you just describe the process that you would put an item through in order to try and uh, get a print? Yes. Um, so the first step in any fingerprint processing 
protocol that we would do at GBI would be to conduct a visual examination. Um, we do two things during this first step. One, we're assessing the item of evidence to determine what the surfaces are made out of, what kind of components um, exist on that item so that we can apply an appropriate processing protocol. And then we're also looking to see if there are any fingerprints that might be visible before we attempt any methods. Um, throughout our process, if at any point we do observe or see something that could be usable for a comparison, we would use um, digital camera system in order to photograph and preserve that evidence. Okay, and is this process generally accepted in this area of expertise? Um, well, the processing that I applied to this item, um, it's a black plastic handle, so it's a, a mostly non-porous surface. So the typical processing protocol for non-porous items would be to use super glue fuming and then possibly a, also a dye stain. Um, in this instance, I did the visual examination and the super glue fuming. Okay. Um, and I think I kind of jumped the gun here. What are um, latent prints? So latent prints, um, everyone has what we refer to as friction ridge skin on the palm sides of your hands as well as the, also the bottoms of your feet. Um, you have basically raised portions of skin that form the ridges and then there are valleys or furrows in between. The ridges on your hands um, and on your fingers basically flow in concert together, but there are different formations within that flow of ridges. Um, Individually, the ridges start and stop or split into two in different places, and it's those placement of all those features that are unique to each individual. What we look for when we do fingerprint work is to see if when someone handled an item, that, that arrangement of features is reproduced on the surface, kind of like if you have a rubber stamp and you put ink on it and then you stamp onto a piece of paper. That's kind of how a fingerprint works. You've got sweat, or oil or dirt or residue that's on your, the surface of your hands and when you handle something you transfer and make an impression of those features on another item. Okay. Um, now, which of, the two, which of the processes did you do on the knife handle? Uh, I, as I stated, I did a visual examination and then super glue fuming. Okay. Um, and what were the results? Uh, the results of my testing in this case were negative. Okay. Now, um, what does that mean? So with our policy at GBI, our, our determination of whether an item has positive results comes down to how many of those features we can see if a fingerprint or a latent print develops, we have to have at least seven to say that it's positive. So in a case where something is negative, it can mean a couple of different things. It can be that there was no development of superglue on that item at all, period. Um, it could be that the whole surface produced a reaction and so nothing can be seen because there's just a total overall reaction. Um, or it can be that there are areas that could have been fingerprint or palm print detail, but there were, they're not clear, they're obscured because they overlay one another or there's just a general lack of clarity. Okay. Um, now, the, for this item here, uh, the texture of the, knife, or of the knife handle itself, would that play any part in whether or not you could get a, a latent print? It could. Um, fingerprint details are very small, so if you have a surface that has texture that is very small as well, it can interfere with how clearly those details are reproduced or how clearly you can discern them as an examiner. Um, from one area to another um, just by interfering and breaking up the, the flow or the con continuity of the ridges that are on the surface. Okay, and uh, this surface, can you uh, just describe as to what it is? In this case, the surface was the plastic knife handle, so it, it did have some texturing to it. Okay. I think that you, you had used the term non-porous. Yes. Okay. Um, other than the texture of the item itself, are there any other factors that could impact the ability to obtain a latent print? Yes, there are a number of different things that could impact that. What are they? Um, so starting with the person who's handling the item, um, if your hands have been freshly washed or your skin is very dry, there's not, excuse me, there's not necessarily a lot of residue on the surface to actually impact a transfer. 
Um, if your skin and your ridges are less robust, maybe your skin is a little older, it's lost a little elasticity, the ridges tend to be a little shorter, a little more softened, um, they don't record or reproduce as well in fingerprints. Um, the surface of the item, like I said, texture versus something smooth can impact how well a print can be seen. Um, the type of material it is can play a part. Like I said, this is a non-porous item. Um, non-porous surfaces are typically non-absorbent, so any residue that makes up a fingerprint is just sitting on the surface and could, is very delicate. And it could be easy to destroy or damage um, that fingerprint until it's processed. Um, the way an object is handled, um, if you think about it in terms of like things that are a tool, they're meant to be handled in a specific way. So if one person handles it and then another person handles it in the same manner, the second person's prints may be erasing or obliterating those of the first. Um, and just overlaying on top of them. And so you're taken away from the clarity that could be observed. Okay. So there's a lot of factors at play in whether or not you can obtain a print. Yes. All right. uh, every time you do this process, do you always obtain, do you always obtain a print? No, not always. Okay. Um, so now, I want to show you a photo of space exhibit. 32. Can you, can you take a look at that? What is that? Um, States Exhibit 32 of, is a photograph of a 35 pound weight. Okay. Now, the, the grip of the dumbbell, what kind of uh, surface is that? Um, this one appears to be made out of metal. Um, it may have some sort of clear coating to keep the metal from rusting, but it looks like the handle also has um, some texturing, probably to improve grip. Would the grip itself be um, a texture that you would expect to, to get a print from? Um, we may see development if it were to be processed, but it wouldn't be very. I wouldn't expect to see very clear and usable fingerprint detail. The fact that you got a negative, um, a negative result on the knife handle, does that mean that the knife handle wasn't touched? No, not necessarily. What does it mean then? It just means that there wasn't any detail that was clear enough to be used to do a, a comparison to known exemplars. I have no further questions, Judge. Good afternoon. And you did your examination of this particular item on what day? Um, the processing to, that I completed took place on May 27th, 2022. Okay. And the item was received by the GBI on what day? Um, our records indicate that it was received at the laboratory on May 23rd. Now, how many days or I guess hours did you actually work on this particular item? Um, all of my analysis was completed in a, a single day. Um, a typical super glue fuming run takes about a half an hour to 45 minutes to complete. Um, since my results were negative, there wasn't a additional time spent to do imaging or photography. So the actual analysis from start to finish maybe took two hours total. So the item was received by the GBI on May 23rd of 2022, correct? Yes. And it was received from the Cab County District Attorney's Office. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, you said you did you did your examination on the twenty seventh. Yes, sir. And it looks as though you completed your report on that same day. Um. Yes, I did. 
And you were telling us that there can be various reasons why you have negative results. Yes. And in this case, you mentioned to us that sometimes you have to have at least seven. I know you used to call them points. What do you, what do you, what do you call them nowadays? Uh, the terminology we use are minutia. Minutia. Okay. It was, it was easier when we called them points. So you had to have at least seven minutia, correct? Yes. Um, but sometimes you don't have seven. Right. And that yields a negative result. Yes. Is that what happened here in this case? Um, it's possible um, with negative results. We don't photograph anything that's negative, so it would be hard to say for sure. Um, not having an exact memory of this specific case from over a year ago now, uh, or about a year ago, as far as what the actual conditions of it were. Okay. So could you mention also that it could be that uh, during the super glue fuming that there's no development? Yes. And so given what you're telling us that you don't recall if that's why you had a negative result. Um, right. We don't record the reason it's negative. If we had enough detail to, to render a positive result, all of that would be photographed. But in instances where we have a negative, it's simply recorded as being negative. Okay. And as you mentioned, that there's, there's sort of, a, I guess, two steps. I guess one is basically looking with your naked eye or you do it through a microscope. Um, we do have magnifying glass and lam lamps with magnifying glass available to use. Um, typically, no, not a microscope, um, but most of what we're looking at is done, yes, with the naked eye. And I assume that in this case, when you look with your naked eye, you weren't able to make a determination. Well, I did make a determination. The determination. Yes. Now, Mr. Emmons just asked you about dumbbells. In this case, back in May of 2022, were you asked to examine a dumbbell? No, I wasn't. Okay. Did you ask, were you asked to examine the item there in state exhibit number 32? Not to my recollection. Thank you. Can you read direct? No, Your Honor. May the witness be excused? Yes. Mr. Queen. Yes, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Call your next witness. Your Honor, let's take off uh, Kimberly Jewett. I do. My name is Kimberly, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y, Jewett, J-E-W-E-T-T. -E Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, where do you work? I work for the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, Division of Forensic Sciences, commonly referred to as the State Crime Lab. Okay. And how long have you worked there? For 13 years. And uh, what's your title there? I'm a microanalyst for the trace evidence section. Okay. And as a microanalyst, what, what are your duties? I analyze evidence that is small in size, usually requiring the aid of a microscope to examine it. So things like hair, fiber, gunshot primer residue, things like that. Okay. Um, and I think you said how long you've worked there. How long have you actually been a microanalyst there? For all 13 years. All right. Um, and what kind of uh, education uh, do you have? I have a Bachelor of Science degree in biology with a minor in chemistry from the University of West Georgia. I've completed two courses at the Macron Research Institute in Chicago, Illinois, one on applied polarized light microscopy, the other on human and animal hair. 
I've completed a course at Hook College of Applied Sciences in Westmont, Illinois on hair analysis. I've completed a 12 month training program at GBI for hair analysis, a six week training program for fracture match analysis, and a six month training program for gunshot primer residue analysis. Okay, and is that all the training that you've had to have in order to do this job? Yes, it is. Okay, now uh, the processing of hair itself, how long have you done that? I've done that for all 13 years, uh, minus the 12 months of training. Okay, um, now in, in the 13 years, how many cases of, of processing hair do you think you've worked? Approximately 570. Um, now, have you, uh, have you ever testified as an expert? Yes, I have. How many times? 50. Okay. Um, and Your Honor, at this time we would tend to her in as an expert in trace evidence and micro, micro analysis. Do you have objection? No objection. She will be so recognized. All right. Now, Ms. Jewett, did, um, did the GBI receive items for trace analysis in this case in April of 2022? Yes, it did. Okay. Now, uh, this case that we're talking about, is there a certain number that's assigned to this case? There is. What is that number? If, my, if I can refer to my notes. 2019-1005039. Okay. Now, when, when you receive the, or when the GBI receives the, uh, the hair for trace analysis, what, is it, what happens? So when it, the evidence is first received into the lab, uh, it, a unique crime laboratory case number will be placed on each new case that comes in. Each new case or item that comes in will have a unique item number also associated with it. So those items will have a barcode placed on the item so we can track it as it goes through the lab. Uh, the items will also be imaged as it comes in and all submitting documentation will also be scanned into the case file. Okay, and what, what items did trace analysis receive in this case? We received hair identified as recovered from the hand of Shirley Merritt and the known head hair of Shirley Merritt. Okay. Um, and how were these items packaged? They were both packaged inside of a brown paper bag that was sealed with red evidence tape and an initial was across the seal. Inside that brown paper bag were two Ziploc plastic bags. One of these Ziploc plastic bags was labeled as hair from the hand of Shirley Merritt. It was zipped closed and had a label over the top. The other Ziploc plastic bag was labeled as the known head hair of Shirley Merritt. It was also zipped closed with a label over the top. Okay. When, when the items were received, did they appear to have been tampered with or damaged in any way? No, they did not. Okay. Now, what, what was requested of you to be done with these items? It was requested that I analyze the hair from the hand of Shirley Merritt, see if any of those hairs were suitable for comparison, and if they were to compare them to the known head hair of Shirley Merritt microscopically. Okay, and uh, so that, that comparison, can you describe that process? Yes, first I began by looking at the hair identified as from the hand of Shirley Merritt. I did this visually and with a stereo microscope. A stereo microscope is a low powered microscope going up to about 64 times magnification that has a greater working distance underneath and lets us see more external features of what we're examining. In doing this, I mounted all of the hairs that were identified as from Shirley Merritt that we call questioned hairs onto a labeled slide. That slide, it, or slides in this case, multiple, were examined under a stereo microscope and a compound light microscope. A compound light microscope is a higher magnification microscope, normally going from 100 to 400 times magnification. With this, it also uses transmitted light. So we're able to see more internal features of the hairs. So with this stereo microscope and compound light microscope, I go through each questioned hair and try to classify them as I can. So whether they're suitable for comparison, we attempt to determine a body origin they could have come from and an ancestry they could have come from. At that point, since there were hairs suitable for comparison from the hands, I then mounted the known head hair of Shirley Merritt. Those were also mounted onto labeled slides, examined under the stereo microscope and compound light microscope, so I can get to, get to know the features that exhibit within the known hair. Once all of those are mounted, I put the questioned hair on a comparison microscope and the known head hair on a comparison microscope. 
a comparison microscope. It's two compound-like microscopes that are connected by an optical bridge with a triocular head on top. So with this, I can put the slide of the question here on one side, the known here on the other, and I can see them in one field of view at one time. So each question here that's suitable for comparison will be uh, compared to the known hair standard of at least 25 hairs from root to tip. So each question here is compared separately to the known. After that, I can draw a conclusion as to if they're consistent or inconsistent in microscopic characteristics. Okay, so there's, to, to kind of break that down, there's, there's multiple steps then. Yes. So the first step is to take the hair that, that was from the hand? Yes. Okay, and when you have that hair, you're looking at that hair to determine whether or not it's suitable for comparison? Correct. Okay, what, um, how many hairs did you have to work with? The total number of hairs in this case were 25 hairs. Okay. Um, and of the 25 hair, well, actually, what would, what would make a hair suitable for a comparison? It has to exhibit enough characteristics or features that a comparison can be known. So things like pigment that naturally exist in a hair um, should be present. Pigment is a granule that gives the hair its color, and that can change throughout the hair. So what the color is, does that color change? Also, do those granules, how do they distribute within the hair? Are they evenly distributed all the way through? Are they clumped together? Does that change throughout the hair? Things like that. So we get to know a lot just from the pigment. But other characteristics such as that, we have to have enough characteristics and features to be able to do a comparison. Okay. Now, of the 25 hairs that you had, how many were suitable for a comparison? Eight of them. All right. So the first step is determine how many are... are are suitable? Correct. Right? And then the second step is to look at the known hair. Is that right? After determining if they're suitable for comparison, then we can look at the known hair and get familiar with the known hair. Yes. Okay. Um, and you did that here? I did, yes. Now, of the eight hairs that were suitable for comparison, um, what, what did you find? Uh, in examining all of the hairs, I determined that there were hairs unsuitable for comparison and eight hairs characteristic of European ancestry um, and characteristic of head hair that were suitable for comparison. Those eight hairs compared to the known hair of Shirley Merritt were consistent in microscopic characteristics. Okay. Um, now, what, I think you said what the factors were as far as what would make hairs unsuitable? Well, okay. So. Eight hairs, of the eight hairs, eight, they were all a match then? They were all microscopically consistent to the known head hair, yes. Okay. Now, of the remaining hairs that were unsuitable, what were some of the factors that you saw in this case that didn't allow you to proceed? All of the hairs that I noted were white in color, and by white, it means that it lacked pigment. So again, that's something we get a lot of information from is the pigment, what gives it its color. So since there wasn't any of that pigment, pigment I wasn't able to do a comparison. Okay. Now, after you finished this process, was there a, um, uh, did you prepare a report? Yes, I did. Okay, and um, what, di what is the date of your report? The date is 5-18-2022. Okay, and the findings on your report are the same that you just went through here? They are. Okay. Um, now, after you did the micro analysis on the hair, um, what what's normally what do you normally do next? Normally, in a situation like this, I would be done because this is what we would consider not probative. So it's expected that you're going to find hair of an individual on that individual. We're not proving anything else. We already know she was there. A probative example would be if a subject's hair was found on a victim's clothes. Victim's hair is found on subject's clothes. You're showing that someone was in contact with each other that you didn't necessarily know before. In those situations, we normally go a step further after a consistent result and send a route for nuclear DNA analysis. Okay, um, and so here, what did you do next? In this case, it was specifically requested that we send roots for nuclear DNA analysis, even though it's not our normal policy. So I went ahead to do that step. Can you just describe that process? Yes. In doing that, I look at the roots for a hair. That's the portion that would be suitable for DNA or nuclear DNA if it's possible. In looking for the roots, we have to determine if it's either antigen, 
which is an actively growing hair and a hair that has to somewhat be forced out, or a catagintelligen hair, which is a hair that just naturally sheds. But if it's catagintelligen, it has to have follicular tissue or skin still attached to the catagintelligen hair. So if it has one of those two things, an antigen root or a catagintelligen root with follicular tissue, it's suitable for nuclear DNA analysis. So anything that was suitable, in this case, all of the hairs were looked at. They were imaged as to how they appeared. They were cut and each of them placed into their own individual vials. They were made into new item numbers and sent to forensic biology for nuclear DNA analysis. Okay. And you did that here? I did. Um, after you sent the items to the, what's the department again? I'm the sorry. forensic biology section. The biology uh, section. After you sent the items to the to the biology section, did you do anything else on this case? I did not. That was the end of my examination. I have no further questions, Judge. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Question for you. You mentioned that the case number is 2019-1005039, correct? Correct. And however, you just mentioned that the case was taken in on 428 of 2022. The items that I received were taken in on 428, 2022. Now tell us why it appears though there's a 2019 case number on items in which you examined in 2022. Uh, the 2019 case number would be from whenever the very first item was submitted and then the, I, the request was, or excuse me, the case was made. Um, I can't say why these items weren't submitted until 2022, only they were submitted on um, April 28th, 2022. So was any examination done of these particular items in 2019 or 2020 or 2021 to your knowledge? Uh, to my knowledge, not at the lab. None of item two for us, which is the hairs from the hand or the known head hair of Shirley Merritt, was, was examined in any way until then. Okay. Now, again, we've already mentioned that on April 28th, the items were received from the Cab County District Attorney's Office, correct? Correct. And on what day did you do your examination, or was it over a course of days? I began it on that same day, April 28th, 2022. And the examination takes more than just a single day, um, so it didn't complete really until my report was released, which was May 18th, 2022. Okay. And you were focused on the, the microanalysis of these hair, pieces of hair. From the hairs, correct. Now, now hair, how many, how many parts are there to hair? Uh, so it depends on how you want to break it down. Um, the structure of a hair, you could almost look at it like it's a pencil. So the pencil has paint on the outside, which is like the scales on your hair. The wooden part of a pencil would be like the main part or the cortex of a hair. And then the lead down the center would be like a medulla that we have at the center of your hair. A medulla is an air sac that runs down the center. It can be present or not in human hair. Um, it can be translucent, which is see-through or opaque, so you can't see through it. And then with animal hairs and things like that, it tends to be more structured. Um, and then you have the tip of your pencil is like the very tip of your hair. And then the eraser part of the pencil is like the root of your hair. So that's the overall structure of a hair. And when you were t looking at those eight that were suitable for comparison, what part of the hair were you looking at? I'm looking at all of it from root to tip if the root is present. Some of these in this case did not have a root. So from the very top of it all the way down to the tip, we compare all of it all the way through. Okay. Now, now with the other ones that were unsuitable, why were they unsuitable? They were unsuitable because they didn't have any pigment in them. So pigment, again, is what gives the hair its color. That pigment exists in the cortex part I was talking about, or the wooden part of your pencil. So without any of that pigment that takes up so much of the middle cortex part of it, there's just not enough to really compare. So comparing the eraser and the point's not good enough? No, we actually have to have it consistent from root to tip, so all the features in each question here fall within the range of the known that's exhibited. And you mentioned that eight were suitable and the unknown did match the known. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? The eight which were suitable, you did compare those, correct? The eight that were suitable were compared to the known hair of Shirley Merritt, yes. And consistent? They were consistent. Okay. Now, 
A second step you did, which is not, sounds like it's not what you always do. Correct. Is basically you look to see what was suitable to forward on biology. Correct. And how many hairs were suitable for biology? There were 18 hair roots that were suitable for biology. Okay. Now, you're talking about the roots. So here we go talking about just the eraser. Correct? Uh, yes. For forensic biology to do their analysis, they only need the root portion. And why is that? That's the only part that you're actually going to get any type of nuclear DNA off of it. The rest of the portion, no matter how many studies have been done, that's not really possible. There's another type of DNA technique that can potentially test that, and it's called mitochondrial DNA. It is not specific to an individual. It is passed from mother to child in an exact, exact replica, and it's not something that we do at GBI. It's something that would have to go for FBI to do, and the FBI does not accept all of the cases that we send in. Um, something like that with this, where there's a microscopical comparison that says it is, it's consistent with this person, and having so many things from DNA, uh, nuclear DNA analysis, I don't think they would actually accept this. Also, if we send something for mitochondrial DNA, it is destructive to the hair and nothing can be done with it after that point. Okay. So we went down that road and let's, come, let's get back where we were. Okay. You tell us about the root and the root goes on to biology, correct? Correct. And they do DNA testing on it? They do. And is that anything you're, which you're involved in? No. Once I cut the roots and send it, I have no further interaction with the case. And in this particular matter, it appears though after, I guess, was it June 1st, which you were last involved in this case? Uh, yes, my last report was June 1st, 2022. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Can you redo it? Just, just real briefly, Judge. Ms. Stewart, um, of all the, the micro analysis of hair that you've done, have you ever had a, ha had a hair sample from a decedent's hand that belonged to somebody who wasn't the decedent? In my experience, no. The cases I've worked where hair from the hand of a victim has always been uh, consistent microscopically to the victim's known hair. I know for the question, Judge. Anything further, this witness? Anyone speak excused? Yes, Judge. Mr. Queen? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Call your next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Alexandra Jason. Yes, my name is Alexandra Jason, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A, -E and Jason is J-A-S-I-N. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, where do you work? I work at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or known as the GBI, um, in the Division of Forensic Science in the uh, Biology Department. Okay, and how long have you worked there? Three years. Uh, and what's your title there? I am a forensic DNA analyst. What does that mean? Um, I receive evidence from state and local agencies and do DNA analysis on them. Okay. Um, and I think I asked, but how long have you worked there? Three years. Three years. Okay. Uh, now, what type of education uh, do you have? Um, I got my bachelor's in forensic biochemistry in 2019 from Northern Michigan University. Okay. And it, in order to become or, or to work in the forensic uh, biology department, what kind of training do uh, uh, do you have? Um, I underwent an extensive training that included oral, written, and practical examinations, as well as a supervised casework period. Okay. Uh, and how many how many cases of DNA typing have you worked? Um, around one hundred. Okay. Uh, and have you ever testified as an expert? I have. Okay. And approximately how many times? Ten. Right. Your Honor, at this time we would tender in Ms. Jason as an expert in the, in the field of
forensic biology and DNA. Any objection? Thank you, Judge. Uh, Ms. Jason, what is DNA? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the blueprint that makes us who we are. We get half of it from our mom, half of it from our dad, and it's unique to each individual with the exception of identical siblings. Okay. And um, how, like, when you, when you perform testing on DNA and to get DNA, how do you do that? So we start with the extraction process, which is where we take a portion of the sample and using chemicals are able to isolate the DNA molecule from the rest of the cellular components. From there, we move on to the quantification process, which is where we determine how much DNA was extracted. From there, we make millions and millions of copies of specific sections of the DNA, um, which is called amplification. Um, from there, we use computers and instruments in order to separate and detect those segments of DNA to make a graph, which we call the DNA profile. Um, and from there, I compare to any known um, individuals from the case. I write my report and come to testify. Okay. Now, as it, re as it relates to this case, I think we've been through this already, but is there a certain case number that's assigned uh, to each case? Yes. Okay. Now, was the case number uh, for this case 2019-1005039? Yes. Okay. Now, as it relates to that case number and any request for DNA, what were you, what were you asked to do? I was asked to do the data analysis for hair samples and for contact swabs on a dumbbell. Okay. Um, a dumbbell? Dumb dumbbell, yep. Let's talk about dumbbell first. What um, contact swabbing, what is that? So contact DNA is just when you touch something, you typically leave skin cells behind. Um, so we can swab that area that we suspect has been touched um, to see if we can get a profile from it. Okay. What items did the, did the GBI have at this time? Um, just in relation to this case, I believe we had the hairs and we had the dumbbell. Uh, do you know who submitted those items? Um, no, but I can look at the chain of custody to find out. Can you? Yeah. May I refer to my notes? Yes. Thank you. Um, we received the dumbbell from the DeKalb County District Attorney. And what date did you get the dumbbell? May 26th. Okay. Um, now, when the when the dumbbell was received by the GBI, what was done in, in order to do any DNA testing on it? Um, a swab was taken, it was a wet dry swab, what we call a wet swab and a dry swab um, was taken of the handle of the dumbbell. Okay, so what, like a piece of cotton was? Yeah, swabbed. typically it looks like a Q-tip, a one-sided Q-tip. Okay, um, and so it was swabbed. Correct. And is the process that you described earlier as far as DNA typing the same that you would do on the contact? Yes. DNA? Okay. Um, now, did you do anything with the swab on the dumbbell? Um, no, once, this, once it's swabbed and then it's tested, so right. it starts the extraction, we just put it back in the envelope and it's returned to the agency. Was it tested? Yes. Okay. What, um, what were the results of the testing on the swab from the dumbbell? It was insufficient. So it, there was DNA, but there was not enough to move forward to the amplification process. Okay. Um, insufficient? Yes. What does that mean? Um, it just means that um, we detected that there was DNA present, but we need a certain amount in order to move forward to um, amplification. Okay. So there was DNA there, just not enough to, to create a profile? Correct. All right. Now, the, what, what, type of, what type of material would you be most likely to, to, to get a good DNA sample off of? Or, yeah. yeah. Um, when it comes to contact DNA, it's best when there's um, a sample that can, or an item that has a lot of friction with it. Um, so the more ridges, if it's a cloth-like material so that um, you could have absorption um, are the best items or the best materials to have. What about how often an item has been used? Yep, how often an item's been used, how often it's cleaned or washed, how recently it's been cleaned or washed, and different environmental factors. Is it left outside? Is it protected? Things like that. Okay. Um, and so here there was an insufficient 
amount of DNA to to go through um, uh, for, uh, to go through further testing. Was there was there anything sent to you to compare it against, anyways? Yes, we had um, a known from Shirley Merritt and a known from Richard Merritt. Okay. Um, now that that result, the insufficient <coughs> amount of DNA. Do you always receive a full profile? No. Okay. Um, how often do you not get one? Um, it's hard to say. We don't really keep statistics of a percentage of how often, um, but we do typically not like to test contact DNA because we know the likelihood of getting one is still pretty low. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's common. Uh, is it common to have gotten this kind of result then? Yes. Um, the, the fact that there was an insufficient amount of DNA, does that mean that the item had never been touched? No, because um, we did get some DNA, um, the instrument still detected that there was DNA there, just not enough for us to move forward. Okay, so, so we can say that it, it was used? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, the hairs themselves, what, um, what were you asked to do with any hair? Um, the hairs also went through the D DNA analysis process. Okay. And uh, what, what were you asked to test? What items? Uh, we had 18 hairs that were submitted for DNA, and so they all went through the DNA process. Okay. <clears throat> and did you have items to compare any DNA profile that you received uh, from the hair? Yes, we had the knowns from Shir uh, Shirley Merritt and Richard Merritt. Okay. Um, and the same process that was done with the dumbbell to create a profile and tested against that profile. Was that done with the hair as well? Yes. And were the hair roots uh, uh, tested? Yes, the hair roots were tested and they were compared if they moved forward to get a profile. Okay. Now, of the hair roots that were tested, did you get any profiles? Yes. Okay. What were the results of your testing? Um, out of the 18 hairs, 11 of them we got a profile from and one was insufficient for DNA, so like the dumbbell, it didn't move forward to amplification, and one was absent for any DNA. Um, okay, let's talk about the 11, the 11 roots that, that, that had a profile. Uh, can you talk about those? Yes, so out of the eight, or out of those, eight of them had a full profile that I matched to Shirley Merritt, and then three of them had partial profiles that I matched to Shirley Merritt. The, the five where DNA was obtained, but you had a limited uh, data, what does that mean? Yes, so those were inconclusive, or what we call inconclusive. We got DNA profiles or partial profiles possibly from them, but I couldn't make any conclusions because the amount of DNA there or the profile was still so small. Okay. And I think you said that there was one, one route that had an insufficient amount of DNA t uh, to move forward? Correct. And, and that's like the dumbbell? Yes. All right. And then one had an absence of DNA. What does that mean? Um, there's just no DNA detected from the hair being extracted. Does that mean that it didn't come from someone's head? What does uh, that mean? Um, it could mean a, a, plus, a different amount of things. It could have just been a bad hair root. Um, typically, we don't like contact DNA. We don't typically like doing hair because um, it doesn't give you a lot of DNA. Um, we're only testing, it's not like you're getting a clump of hair that we're testing, it's one single root, um, and there's just not a lot of DNA held within the root of that hair. Okay. Um, after the hair has been processed, what, is there anything left? No, um, when it comes to hair analysis, we consume the entire hair. Okay. I know for the questions, Judge. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And you did this process in April of 2022? Correct. Now, you were telling us that over time, DNA deteriorates. It can deteriorate, correct? It can deteriorate over time, yes. Why and how? Um, different factors, again, kind of like with evidence um, when it comes to environmental factors. Say it's left out in the sun for long periods of time. UV um, destroys DNA. Also, um, like cleaning things, um, bleach, stuff like that can also destroy DNA. Now, in this case, one of the things you examined was a dumbbell, correct? Correct. 
And this dumbbell, prior to you doing testing on it in April of 2022, do you have any idea where it was stored, how it was stored, or who it was stored by? Um, the dumbbell, when it was received by the GBI, was properly sealed and packaged. Um, and from that point, it was kept in a few different storage locations within the GBI, including in the biology lab. Now, so that's when it was in your possession, GBI possession. What Correct. About before that? Um, Any idea I, how it was stored or packaged before that? No, I can't speak to how the dumbbell was packaged or anything like that before it got to the lab. Okay. Now, you mentioned contact DNA. And of course, contact, that's, that's like me touching this, this podium, correct? Correct. What about blood? Um, blood on that dumbbell? There was blood on the dumbbell, yes. And was it tested? The blood was tested for <laughs> serology, but it was not DNA tested. Okay. Any idea why? Um, it wasn't requested. Now, contact, blood, where does sweat fall into this? Um, well, sweat kind of helps the skin cells that rub off um, when we touch things through friction to help kind of just stick and absorb to whatever it touches. Okay. Now, is there any idea if there may have been some sweat on the dumbbell? Um, we don't test for that. Okay. And why is that? Um, I honestly don't even know how we would test for sweat. Um, sweat is just your, the oils that come from your hand and precipitation. It's not necessarily, it's just not something we test for. Okay. And you mentioned to us also you tested ha the hairs. Yes. And actually in both cases you had knowns from Richard Merritt and Shirley Merritt, correct? Correct. And as to the hairs, you did find some that were consistent with the DNA profile of Ms. Shirley Merritt. Correct. And I guess, just to be clear, in both cases, regarding the dumbbell, regarding the hairs, you found no DNA consistent with Richard Merritt. Correct. Thank you. Any redirect? Just briefly, Jeff. Uh, the fact that you didn't find a profile matching Mr. Merritt, does that mean that he didn't touch it? Um, no, I, there was DNA there, so someone touched it. Okay. I have no further questions, Judge. Any further questions, this witness? Oh, no. May the witness be excused? Yes, Judge. Yes, Judge. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. How are you next witness? You are, um, we'd ask to resume tomorrow. Our next witness is going to take some time. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we made some really good progress today. I'm going to ask you all to please be back at 9 a.m. tomorrow. We'll uh, continue on with the testimony. If you meet the deputy out in front of 7A, as you did when you came back from lunch, uh, the refrigerator and the microwave and anything that's in the jury room is for your use during the course of the trial. So if you want to bring in snacks or anything like that, feel free to do so. I know it gets a little difficult in the afternoons to stay awake and pay attention, but it is very important that you pay close attention to the evidence. You're not going to have a transcript or anything of the testimony back when you begin your deliberations. So if anyone needs a break, and I try to keep an eye out uh, for anyone dozing off, but if I miss you and you need a break, just please raise your hand and let me know, okay? And we'll, we'll take as many breaks as we need to, because I want to make sure that you're paying close attention to the evidence. Please remember the instruction not to talk about the case or allow anyone to talk to you about the case, all right? Have a nice evening, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Anything we need to address before we recess? Okay. All right. See you all at nine. The exhibits that have been um, admitted, if you all will put them all together, we can uh, lock them up.